Good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Satterwhite. I'm an 11-year prostate cancer survivor and one of the co-founders of Man Up Buffalo, and I'll be the moderator of today's program. I want to thank you for attending the Man Up Virtual Prostate Cancer Symposium. The objectives of today's program, uh, they're to help the newly diagnosed prostate cancer patient, those in active treatment, survivors, and their families with information to help you make informed decisions about your treatment, from diagnosis through survivorship. Physicians specializing in prostate cancer treatments, early detection, and survivorship will share the latest updates in prostate cancer and practical strategies for patients at all stages of the prostate cancer journey. Let me explain how this morning will work. The program is broken out into five segments. Early diagnosis, early disease, advanced disease, survivorship, and care coordination. Each segment is 45 minutes. There'll be two speakers in each section. Each speaker will have 15 minutes. A 15 minute moderated Q&A follows. During the presentation, you can ask questions via the messaging box at the bottom of your screen. Once the presentations have uh, completed, your questions will be read. In the interest of time, I may not get to all your questions. I also want to thank the uh, sponsors for this program. Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, West Terror Automotive Group, Buffalo Medical Group, Senefi Jensen, and Abby Allegan. I also wanted to thank all the medical professionals participating in this morning's program. Dr. Michael Hansley, Buffalo Medical Group. Dr. Eric Kaufman, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Kershaw Guru, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Michael Cuttle, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Peter Van Velhunzen, Wilmot Cancer Center. University of Rochester Medical Center, Dr. Gokumel Chada, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, and Dr. Ali, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, Dr. Chunkip Fung from Wilmot Cancer Center, University of Rochester Medical Center, and also a BSN RN Caitlin Chidester, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Michael Hansley is a staff physician of urology, oncology at Buffalo Medical Group, and he'll be speaking this morning on screen. Welcome, Dr. Hansley. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. So I just want to thank everyone, uh, especially on a Saturday morning, coming out to talk about something like this. It's very important, and uh, I'm glad we could do this in a virtual setting, um, uh, and I was really hoping that we were able to continue on with our uh, endeavors in educating the community about prostate cancer. So uh, my topic this morning is going to be on prostate cancer screening, and we'll go over some of the basics that are involved in this and kind of uh, put to rest some of the things that people often will mention to me that they were concerned about prior to uh, coming into the office for an evaluation. Next slide. So first things first, what is the prostate? The prostate is a gland that is only in men uh, that helps in the uh, creation of ejaculate. Um, it's located between the bladder and it is around the urethra. So that's the tube that the urine comes out. As we age, this gland has a tendency to grow uh, and can actually compress upon the urethra, causing some urinary symptoms. Unfortunately, one of the problems with this gland is it can also develop cancer. Um, that cancer is one of the most common cancers that we find in men um, and is very easy to detect when screened appropriately. So, you know, the question of who should be getting screened. There's lots of different guidelines about which patients are appropriate to be screened, when we should start screening, but the most important thing is to kind of look at your risk factors and also discuss with your physician if you're a candidate to be screened. Typically, those are men somewhere in the age of 45 to 50 years of age. We look to see if they have a family history of prostate cancer. Um, we look at other factors as well, including their urinary symptoms. Um, and the prostate cancer screening itself is very simple. It takes nearly less than a minute uh, to complete in its to total. There's no invasive procedure that's involved in the actual first step of the screening. Uh, and it often can catch some of the more deadly forms of the prostate cancer disease. Next slide. So what's involved in the prostate cancer screening? There's two main things that are involved in the preliminary portion of it. 
One is a blood test, which some of you may have heard of, called the PSA. This is a simple test that can be done in the office or in a lab and just requires a small amount of blood to be drawn. This test will often detect uh, an elevation in the level that may be associated with prostate cancer. But that test is also elevated in a number of other causes. Um, mm -hmm. There is some controversy associated with the use of this blood test over the past year that uh, people may or may not have been aware of. This is well publicized, but in general, the test is a good test when used in an appropriate setting and uh, evaluated by a clinician who is capable of understanding the results. The other part, which is very simple, but oftentimes patients are reluctant to undergo is the digital exam. Mm -hmm. The digital exam is done in the office by your uh, medical provider. and basically is just a finger into the rectum to palpate the prostate. There are certain forms of prostate cancer that the blood test may not pick up. And this portion of the exam is actually one of the most important uh, components that is often overlooked. Through the digital exam, you can feel the prostate gland and you can palpate sometimes nodules or uh, abnormalities that are located within the prostate. This often may be a sign of a early prostate cancer or in some cases even an advanced prostate cancer. Um, this is a very important step in the actual screening of the prostate uh, to check for cancer and is oftentimes overlooked, but it is very simple and extremely painless. And despite everyone's apprehension, it is not bad at all. It's very quick. Next slide. So some common misconceptions. We hear this from patients all the time that come in. I don't have any symptoms. I'm fine. Why would I have to be screened for prostate cancer? Typically, prostate cancer will not give you any symptoms until the disease is advanced. So the concept that you know, you're not having problems with anything from urination to erections, that everything is probably fine it is false. Um, again, the urinary symptoms, although are important in screening for prostate cancer, is often not one of the uh, presenting symptoms. The other thing we hear commonly from patients is, I had a colonoscopy. They said my prostate was fine. I have nothing to worry about. Well, during a, a colonoscopy, they oftentimes will go through the colon, but they may or may not see where the prostate sits on the opposite side of the colon. Um, so this idea that if you had a colonoscopy, they're also doing a prostate cancer check is oftentimes incorrect um, and needs to be considered when we see you in the office for this or are undergoing an evaluation. Next slide. So what's involved with the testing itself? So if your PSA test or your digital exam or both are abnormal, Oftentimes, your provider may repeat the blood test, uh, or if they feel a nodule, will recommend some sort of additional testing. There's two options that are often considered. One is a prostate biopsy, and the other is an MRI. Mm -hmm. A prostate biopsy is a very simple test where an ultrasound probe is placed into the rectum. The ultrasound probe is roughly the size of the clinician's finger, so it's very similar to the digital exam. Typically for that procedure, there'll be a little local anesthetic that's provided to the prostate and 12 quick little biopsy cores are taken. This is done with the assistance of a needle. I can tell you the majority of the patients that come in when we talk to them about this will say, my friend had this, this is the worst exam ever. He said, don't go through this. It's the, the, one of the worst things you could have done. I always tell them that that is completely false. And most of the times you will not feel much, if anything, you'll feel a little pinch or a little pressure as we numb the prostate gland. But for whatever reason, this myth that this is an extremely painful task has been perpetuated throughout the community. Another uh, less invasive approach is an MRI. An MRI is often uh, done to help evaluate uh, the prostate gland for any abnormalities. Typically, when we do a biopsy, there's spots in the prostate that we're checking for prostate cancer. An MRI can actually see other areas in the prostate that we don't typically biopsy due to the low likelihood of prostate cancer that's in there. Some of you may or may not be aware of the recent uh, diagnosis of Al Roker, but this is where some of these MRIs come in that are controversial. He was a patient who underwent an MRI test, which reportedly was normal, but when underwent a biopsy, was found to have prostate cancer. So the MRIs are very helpful in certain instances, but cannot be used as a substitution for a prostate biopsy. Um, but they really have changed the way that we manage prostate cancer patients and have allowed us to also diagnose patients that we may have normally missed a prostate cancer somewhere else in the uh, prostate. Next slide. So what happens if my tests are abnormal? Well, well, the first thing is 
always take a step back. Prostate cancer, if you are diagnosed with, is, again, one of the most common diseases among men. For whatever reason, though, men don't ever talk about this, but I guarantee you if you have been diagnosed, you know somebody else who has been diagnosed as well and is likely has gone through treatment. Um, the, the notion that you're alone on this is completely false. There's tons of resources that are available to help you, and the disease, if caught early enough, is very treatable and with excellent outcomes. The old uh, side effects of a lot of the treatments have improved significantly, and we see patients now who live completely normal lives with minimal side effects from treatment. Um, but it's very, very important to undergo testing for this and seek out consultation with an appropriate specialist if there is some abnormality. Um, to just ignore any of the possible screening tests like the blood test or the digital exam just because you're afraid is setting you up for a potential long-term complication if the disease is missed at an early stage. So hopefully everyone out there can kind of relate to this or have gone through this or can understand uh, the importance of this testing, which is very, very simple. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Hensley. Um, thank you, Dr. Hensley. Uh, next up is um, Dr. Eric Kaufman. Uh, he's a staff physician of your uh, urologic uh, oncology at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. He'll be speaking this morning on active surveillance. Welcome, Dr. Kaufman. And the dog. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Appreciate it. Uh, as Richard said, my name is Eric Kaufman. I'm at Roswell Park, and uh, thanks all for coming out today. As, as Dr. Hansley said, it's just really important topics to be aware of, and, and uh, thanks for taking your time on this Saturday morning to do that. So I'm talking about active surveillance, and I'm going to approach this by kind of going through the what, whens, who's, hows of active surveillance. So we're going to start with what is active surveillance. Active surveillance is the monitoring of a patient's cancer for signs of progression to determine if curative treatment is necessary. So the goal here is to delay curative treatment. If we can avoid it altogether, that's great. But for a lot of men, that's not going to be the case. And truly, that's not the goal. It's just to delay it. And why would we delay it? Because we want to delay its side effects. Uh, as you, you guys all have probably heard, um, the treatments, the curative treatments in particular, come with some long-term uh, side effects pretty frequently. Now, during active surveillance, we want to delay, but without losing the ability to cure. So if we do need a cure in future, we can always jump in and do it at that time. So why would someone do this? Again, you can, if you can delay, uh, if the delay to treatment has minimal cancer risk, but that delay can increase the years a patient spends without having to have the treatment side effects, then it's, it's beneficial. So while we're talking about what is active surveillance, we also want to talk about what active surveillance is not. Active surveillance is not what we call observation. You'll hear that term thrown around, also watchful waiting or sometimes expectant management. These are all synonyms for observation, which is not active surveillance. The difference is here we're monitoring a patient's cancer to reduce or prevent symptoms, but without the intent to cure. Remember, active surveillance, we never really, we never want to give up the chance to cure. With observation, we have no intent to ever cure. There may be hormone therapy, but that's not curative. Curative treatments like radiation or surgery will never be done. What's the benefit? Why would a patient give up the option for curative treatment? Well, there's less testing if you go on observation. You don't have repeat biopsies. You don't have repeat MRIs. Uh, PSA can be checked less often, for example, just once a year. But patients have to accept we're not, with observation, we're not trying to prevent metastasis. Metastasis may happen. Why would we let metastasis happen? Well, in the cases of observation, we think if metastasis will happen, it can remain asymptomatic and it can remain non-fatal. So the cancer these are for cancers that we don't think will ever take a patient's life, even if they metastasize. So kind of looking at this table here, difference between observation, active surveillance and observation, testing is frequent with active surveillance, less frequent with observation. Curative treatment may or may not be done with active surveillance, but it will never be done with observation. Active surveillance is gonna to try to prevent metastasis, observation is not, but either of them are gonna prevent symptoms and prevent cancer death. Oh, thanks. Um,
Yeah, I'm not sure why that's not sharing. Do you have the ability to, uh, oh, hold on. So sorry about that, everyone, first of all. And this should work. How's that? Okay. Well, luckily, Dr. Hansley finished a couple minutes early. It gives me a couple minutes to steal from him uh, if Richard lets me. But um, this, I, there was only two slides I did so far. So this was the summary of what active surveillance is. I think we, we went over that well. Um, and this was a slide I was on talking about the difference between observation and active surveillance. Again, I apologize. Uh, we talked kind of here, and I was just going through this table Again, showing active surveillance has testing that's common, but observation testing is infrequent. Curative treatment will be done occasionally with active surveillance, but we don't do it with observation. Active surveillance attempts to prevent metastasis, but with observation, we're not trying to do that. We're letting metastasis happen if it's going to. But either active surveillance or observation are going to prevent symptoms and prevent cancer death. And and before we return to active surveillance, just one more slide on observation. So for which patients would observation be best? These are going to be the patients with less than 10 year life expectancy, people with shorter life expectancy, and particularly all patients with less than five year life expectancy. Well, why is that? Because most non-metastatic prostate cancers, when we diagnose them, at least 90% of them, they require at least 10 years to become fatal. So if your life expectancy is less than five years, you're more likely to die of something else than of your cancer. And we won't put you through the curative treatment and its long-term side effects in that case. Okay, so back to active surveillance. So we talked, what is active surveillance? The next question is why active surveillance? So why active surveillance? It's kind of uh, helpful to, to think of, of these teeter-totters that a lot of you probably played on when you were kids. Uh, maybe some of you still play on them today. The oncologic risk is on one side and treatment risk is on the other. And whichever is higher, whichever risk is higher, it's gonna swing the teeter-totter towards that side. And that when the treatment risk drops down and because it's greater than on oncologic risk, these are the patients that active surveillance are best for. So the treatment risks, um, our other speakers will be talking about treatment more uh, later in the session. So I won't belabor the discussion, but uh, many of you are aware there's some long-term treatment risks with curative intent treatment. But when I say curative intent treatment, I'm talking about the surgery or the radiation. And uh, this, this can be long-term urinary leakage, particularly with surgery, long-term urinary discomfort, such as burning or urgency or frequency, uh, particularly with the radiation. Uh, long-term erectile dysfunction with either of these treatments. Um, and these are pretty frequent. Now we have long-term urinary blockage uh, that can require drains to be put in through the skin into the bladder or a Foley catheter to be used long-term um, or long-term bowel issues such as the uh, uh, rectum getting burned with, with radiation. Uh, luckily, these are pretty uncommon, but they do happen. And when they happen to patients, they significantly, as you can imagine, affect the quality of life. Um, and then on top of these long-term treatment risks, there's short-term treatment risks related to urinary and sexual issues, particularly with the sexual issues. Pretty much all patients are going to have this uh, during the first year after a surgery. So I'd say these, these are common. Um, in contrast, the oncologic risk has the chance of it, of it spreading and taking someone's life. So we balance these two together. And when the treatment risks are greater, then active surveillance is a good option. So we talked about treatment risks. Let's talk more about the oncologic risk. So when we're looking at the cancer, we break it into three groups, a low risk, intermediate risk, and a high risk. And for which groups can we do active surveillance on? Well, this is best to kind of think of as your stoplight. Um, if you hit a red light, you can stop. We're not gonna do active surveillance. If it's a green light, you can go. We can do active surveillance. If it's a yellow light, you need to slow down a little bit and take some caution. These are the patients that you may or may not be able to do active surveillance on, uh, but we have to do it very carefully if we do it. So for the low risk group, the green lights, these can be broken down into very low risk and just your regular low risk. The very low risk is gonna be 
For those who are familiar with the Gleason scoring, the grading system, these are your Gleason score six, your PSA is low, but importantly, you really only have a tiny amount of this Gleason score six, just a speck on the biopsy. For these patients, active surveillance is, is, is pretty much universally the, the best option. What about if you have a larger amount of Gleason 6? This becomes just a regular uh, um, uh, low risk. Or if your PSA is higher, still less than 10, but maybe up around 8 or 9, a lot of these are low risk as well instead of the very low risk. For most of these patients, active surveillance is still a better option. In other words, the, act, the oncologic risk is still outweighed by the treatment risk. Um, and we see about a less than 1% metastasis chance. Uh, and I'd say, to be honest, if, if this is done correctly and patients are compliant and come to their visits, don't miss their visits and get their, all their testing, and they can get MRIs, I, I really think the chance of metastasis should be about zero. Now, not every patient can get MRI. That raises the risk a little bit, but your chance is still less than 1%. So this is very, very safe uh, for low risk. Let's, let's jump over to high risk. And the red, red stoplight here, well, these are going to be your Gleason score, 8 to 10s, high-grade cancers, PSAs are high. These, we don't do active surveillance for any of these patients. These patients need, need uh, a treatment um, immediately, or at least in the next three months or so. Intermediate risk, this is kind of our slow down cautionary. You could possibly do active surveillance. We break them down farther into favorable intermediate, unfavorable intermediate, unfavorable intermediate, would be Gleason set score sevens, but four plus three, for those who are, are familiar with the difference between three plus four and four plus three, or there's a large amount of the three plus four. So we don't wanna do active surveillance there, treatment's the way to go. But for the favorable, this is gonna be, I do have the Gleason score three plus four equals seven. My PSA is less than 10. And the amount of Gleason score three plus four equals seven is pretty small. This is called a favorable intermediate and we can do active surveillance, but there is a, a little higher risk of metastasis. Uh, and I always tell patients, uh, you have to be able to accept a small chance that this may, we may miss a window for cure while you're on active surveillance. Um, so that's, that's not for everyone, uh, but, uh, and, and most of these patients do end up needing treatment earlier, but a lot of them can get three, two or three or even five years on, on surveillance before they need their treatment. So how do we do active surveillance? Well, here's, the, here's a, a, a table of the testing and how often you need to do it. So the PSA test, which is the kind of foundation for active surveillance is done, of course, initially. But then every six months or less, really doesn't need to be less than six months. Every six months is plenty often. The prostate exam, that's the finger and the rectum to feel the prostate, that's done initially. And then every six to 12 months. So you're getting that once or twice a year. The MRI is... Uh, is controversial, its role in active surveillance, but more and more, uh, it's becoming more common for people to, to support it and for cancer committees to support it. Uh, it, sh it should be done initially in these cases, and then when to repeat it, that, that's still very controversial. Uh, I personally will do it only if the PSA goes up. Some people might do it every one to two years on, on all patients. And then finally, the repeat biopsy. Uh, sometimes we do this right away before you go on active surveillance, and that's called a quote, quote unquote confirmatory biopsy. Um, why would you do confirmatory biopsy? This is for a little higher risk active surveillance patients where we feel the biopsy may have undersampled the cancer. I always tell patients, we only know what's, what's on your biopsy in terms of cancer. We don't know what type of cancer is still in your prostate that wasn't biopsy, that was missed on the biopsy. So this can give more accurate uh, determination of, of what we're dealing with. So we don't put someone on active surveillance who has a, a worse cancer than, than we had thought. And then when to repeat it is similar to the MRI. It's controversial. I, again, only will do it if the PSA goes up, but some people will, will do a scheduled biopsy every one to two years. Uh, just a point, not all prostate MRIs are made equally. That's important to know. Uh, there's difference in the e equipment, the magnet strength. There's different in how the radiologists protocol it. That's, that's their setup of it. And then there's a big difference in how the radiologist in, interpret it. And this is a, seen as a, 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 a real problem and, and challenge in our field to try to get some um, agreement uh, across all radiologists and how they read these. And I just want to show you a picture here. Sometimes a, a, a picture speaks a thousand words. 
um, you can see this is one MRI from a patient. And you see, it's, I always say, it's like looking at a CAT scan underwater. Everything's very blurry. And it looks like one of these Rorschach ink blots. And uh, so you can see why different people would read them differently. And I recommend that you always consider, you don't have to get it, but consider a second opinion if, if there's any question on, uh, on having your MRI read. Uh, when to convert from active surveillance to treatment. So the number one uh, uh, determinant is when the grade looks worse on the biopsy, but there are other determinants, such as if your PSA is increasing, there's growth on your prostate exam, the MRI shows growth, the amount of cancer on your biopsy looks like more. But it's important to determine none of these, uh, to know none of these determinants is definitely uh, an indicator of that the cancer is getting worse. So we don't have any tool that can tell that reliably. Um, so I'm just going to show an example of that. What do I mean by that? So this, let's look at this patient. He, he had a biopsy for Gleason 6, and uh, I mean for PSA of 6. And here's his cancer. We can't see it on our ultrasound, but this is where it actually is. And you can see the needle just happened to hit the, the, the corner of it. And that was a low volume Gleason 6. But what we don't know is that that red stuff in there is a pattern four, and this is actually a Gleason 7. But the biopsy didn't show that, just called it a Gleason 6. So we put him on surveillance. His PSA went up to 6.2, but the tumor didn't change over two years. See, tumor looks the exact same. PSA is now 6.2. Biopsy is repeated. The needle gets closer to the center of the, of the tumor, and uh, the biopsy will show that it's now high volume, but the tumor itself hasn't grown. The biopsy suggests it has, but the tumor hasn't grown. The patient continues on surveillance. The PSA actually goes down to 6.0. A repeat biopsy is done, and now the red part is hit. That is the pattern four that shows Gleason 7. That Gleason 7 was always there. It never changed. The tumor never changed, but the biopsy result changed over time, made it look like the cancer is getting worse. So this is just an example of we have to be a little cautious. The biopsy itself even doesn't always isn't always a perfect indicator to show us what the cancer is doing. And uh, last, before I conclude, um, I just want to comment because I'm sure you have questions on the biomarker test is kind of the future of, of active surveillance in prostate cancer. These are other biomarker tests, meaning not PSA. They're sometimes called genomic or molecular tests. And they're used at many different stages, screening, diagnosis, after cancer diagnosis for prognosis. The important thing for active surveillance is most of these have not yet been studied for active surveillance. So if you've heard about a PHI test or 4K test, patients always ask us about these. Haven't been tested yet for active surveillance. Those are for other purposes in prostate cancer. The only few that have been tested for active surveillance are shown here, Oncotype DX, Prolaris, and Promark. But the problem of these is so far they've just shown benefit over a doctor using a single PSA value in their testing, but in, in their research, they showed it was better than a single PSA value. But us doctors, we don't use just a single PSA value. We use PSA speed, PSA trend, age-adjusted PSA, PSA density, which is related to prostate size, MRI findings. These, their research with these biomarkers never incorporated these variables. So the problem is there's no clear biomarker benefit when doctors have access to these other clinical variables, particularly when they're using MRI. And these tests are expensive. A lot of the times the cost falls on the patient and they also give vague results occasionally, or I'd say commonly, uh, that are not informative. So right now these markers, the current markers are not yet recommended by national committees, but some committees do suggest consideration of them in select cases. So there are occasional cases where I think it can be helpful. Okay, in summary, active surveillance is a great option for all low-risk prostate cancer patients and some intermediate-risk patients who wish delay, to delay treatment and its potential side effects. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Hensley, thank you uh, both very much. Uh, a lot of information and it is um, uh, very useful. I, I have, uh, there's a lot of questions that have been generated uh, in, uh, while you've been speaking and uh, I'll kind of start off with what's coming so far. Uh, one of the questions, I'll uh, direct this over to, uh, to you, Dr. Hansley. Uh, what may be uh, common symptoms of prostate cancer? Um, so for, as Eric kind of talked about, there's different 
types of prostate cancer from low grade to high grade. Typically low grade uh, disease, you may not have any symptoms at all, which is why it's important to get screened. Uh, even high grade disease oftentimes won't have any symptoms. Advanced disease, unfortunately, typically presents with low back pain, which means it's spread uh, into the spine or uh, pelvic bones. Um, so to go off symptoms, there's really no symptoms that patients will present with. That's why the importance of the test, because everyone usually feels good coming in with no real complaints, and they all think that they're in great shape without any disease. So that's why it's important. And when I came through, as I, as I said on the, uh, the outset of the program, I'm also a, I'm an 11 year prostate cancer survivor. Uh, what got me to come in to see my doctor? Now, uh, as a rule, I regularly go for checkups. Uh, what got me in uh, early uh, was I had symptoms. I was 44 when I was diagnosed. I had symptoms uh, that, uh, at least at the time, I understood to be associated with um, enlarged prostate, uh, difficulty with urination, uh, also uh, ED issues. Uh, when I actually had my, uh, my PSA, uh, eventually a, P a PSA DRE, and you know, eventually uh, uh, the um, biopsy, uh, and it came with a Gleason 7 uh, for me. Uh, I was told my cancer for, uh, I was, was pretty advanced, but fortunately for me, it was encapsulated. So was, you know, the prostate was, uh, the cancer was inside the prostate, so I had a uh, radical prostatectomy. Uh, so, but I did have symptoms. So for those, uh, those, uh, those folks, um, I guess I guess it would be the advice would be if you um, if anything's out of the normal, see your doctor immediately, right? Absolutely, and I mean that's the thing. They may or may not be tied to the prostate cancer, but if you're in that age right. bracket or if there's any concern at all, it's such a simple test that you know to forego that just out of the fact that you don't feel anything. I don't think is always in your best interest, but it's important to take that into consideration. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I have one for uh, Dr. Kaufman. Um, uh, why wouldn't you want to remove or treat the cancer immediately uh, rather than wait and see what happens? It's scary to think of letting uh, six months go by before I get tested again. Yeah, so uh, definitely active surveillance is not for for everyone. If you have real high levels of anxiety about it, then it's not for you because the whole purpose of it is to improve your quality of life. We, the patients who we recommend active surveillance for, we believe we can increase your quality of life without compromising your, your cancer care. So we would not say take a six month delay if, if we thought that six month delay would be uh, hurtful to you. But on the other hand, if during that six month, you're going to have a lot of anxiety and uh, it's on your mind all the time, you can't sleep, you can't focus on things, then it's it's not worth it. Um, for those patients, it's best to go with uh, directly to treatment. The for the other patients where the anxiety is not the issue, the big benefit is you're delaying the onset of these symptoms that can happen after treatment. So just to to rehash it, the long term urinary incontinence, long term uh, a worsening sexual function, the long term even if you're not leaking, you can have urgency and frequency where you're going to bathroom a lot more often. Um, and the problem with these long-term side effects from the treatment is they tend to be, when, when they're long-term, they tend to be permanent. There's not a good treatment that, uh, they can be very difficult to treat. So if a patient can say, hold on, I'll, I'll go through that, but I'm gonna wait five years to do it. I'd like to have another five years where I'm not yearning more often, where I'm not leaking, where I still, um, can have intercourse with my wife, um, and then in five years, I'll go through all those risks. So that's, that's why we would delay. But again, it's not for everyone if you have high anxiety. Okay. Um, I have another question, um, and this is uh, uh, to, to, uh, to both of you because you both uh, initially do uh, the same type of exams, the uh, visual rectal exam, um, you, do, you do basic exams. Um, because of the, uh, the high incidence among uh, uh, for prostate cancer among men of color, uh, black men, uh, Hispanic, uh, Native Americans, and so forth, uh, um, why are black men um, most reluctant to have uh, uh, DREs or uh, the, uh, the testing in general done? Is that something that you can speak to? I, I, I didn't get that second part, Richard. What did you say? Why didn't uh, you the, 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 question, the question is about uh, uh, black men uh, and, and they're being reluctant. Uh, to have the digital rectal exam 
or or the uh, or the PSA or any testing at all. I yeah. So I I think that's a uh, uh, so th there's there's definitely a higher risk among African Americans for uh, cancer diagnosis, and African Americans are therefore recommend to get screening early. Um, and there's there are issues there for sure with uh, you know reluctance to get the test, but I think that's that's across all races with reluctance to get the test in this in kind of younger individuals who may be at higher risk in the 40s and 50s and you know even even older older patients. I I think um, that's just a personal uh, you know some people are more reluctant and men tend to have that. A little more than women in terms of dealing with their uh, being proactive about their health. Yeah. Um, I know that you know. Speaking historically, there also has been some uh, some challenges with uh, healthcare fears uh, that play into it. Uh, is there uh, anything about that? Yeah, I and I. I mean, a lot of it has to do with access to appropriate healthcare too. I mean, you have some of these areas where uh, you know patients aren't getting appropriately screened or they're in overrun clinics where, you know, some of the details that you would not normally see in other communities uh, get overlooked. And I think prostate cancer is one of them, just because from a provider standpoint, if it's not something that you're doing on a regular basis, you may not feel comfortable checking a prostate just because you don't want to put your finger in someone's rectum. But um, it's very important. I mean, I always try to educate, especially when I see an African-American man come into my office younger, I always really, really drive home the fact that they need to be talking to their, their brothers, their cousins, their uncles, their sons to make sure that they're trained. Because it's so, it's such a silent killer that nobody talks about it, especially in the minority community. I feel like it's, uh, they really, really are reluctant to, to speak about it, but it needs to be addressed more, more so than ever because there's such high risk. Of it. I, I, and I'll echo one thing, uh, a really good point Dr. Hansey just, just made here too, is uh, not all the primary care doctors will do it. And sometimes it's the patient needs to be proactive and ask the primary care doc to do it or, or why they're not doing it. Because uh, the, the data on using the PSA is, is uh, Dr. Hansley touched on is, is controversial, but the data on using the rectal exam is not. It is a very highly effective way of screening. And sometimes the primary care docs might get a little uh, lazy with it. It can be a little easier just to check the PSA test. And you know, they don't wanna put the patient through something uncomfortable, but it's a, it's a five second test. And uh, uh, sometimes the patient needs to be a little proactive and remind and ask about it. Yeah, that's one of the things that uh, with, uh, with Man Up, uh, one of the things we try to do in the community is uh, getting, uh, uh, making men aware of, of um, the fact that this simple test can save your life. Okay. Yeah. The goal always is to try to get a baseline so that your doctors are able to track, especially if you have a family history, and to, you know, to, to get over yourself, uh, essentially to man up, uh, because it's no big deal. And in uh, some cases, I'm sure that uh, you and your significant other have probably done more challenging things. Okay, we're all adults here, so uh, it's uh, it's a simple procedure. Uh, get over it and uh, uh, see your doctor. Um, I know. Have, well I know well I, said, Richard. Well, I'm just trying to be honest. I mean, that's yeah. that's what we need here. A little bit of honesty. Uh, I have um, another one. Uh, is monitoring after a biochemical recurrence also considered uh, active surveillance, or is active surveillance only before initial treatment? That's yeah. Active surveillance is only before initial treatments when you're using that phrase active surveillance um, yeah. you can survey or observe after um, when you have biochemical recurrence after radiation or, or surgery but that's not termed active surveillance yeah that's a really good point um, and it can be confusing but we when we say the phrase active surveillance that's always in a untreated patient okay thank you thank you um, how important is it that the urologist and the oncologist communicate with one another and when does one refer uh, to the other? You're going to see your primary urologist, your primary. When, at what point do they make that determination that you need to? Are you saying uncol between the urologist and oncologist? If if they're two separate people, yes. Because I know that we we do have urologists who aren't oncologists. Yep. Right. I I mean I can speak for because we're we're in separate separate settings. I'm in a more of a, 
um, a community setting where Eric's in uh, institution. So in my setting where there's uh, multiple, you know, there's radiation oncology, there's medical oncology, and there's urology, uh, throughout the community, I mean, you know, I have an oncology background when I worked at Roswell, but I think it's important to see somebody who has some specialty training in uro-oncology versus just, per se, maybe a random, you know, a urologist. And, I mean, it's always good to get multiple opinions on this. As far as medical oncology goes, typically, unless somebody has concern for advanced disease, the role for that is just more information gathering than anything. Because a lot of the therapies that they may provide would be something for somebody with advanced disease. But, I mean, Eric can speak to what, what it's like in a bigger institution where there's more of a little bit more multidisciplinary approach where I have more of a, if I have concern for it, I would send somebody to a medical oncologist. But typically with my background in uro-oncology, I'm more than comfortable enough managing um, just, you know, regular prostate cancer without advanced, advanced disease into the bones or anything. So. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Kaufman, did you have anything else on that? No, I think uh, I think Dr. Hansley said it very well. I think you know the urologists are are capable of of uh, with without oncology background are are capable of of managing prostate cancer. They're trained in that as well. The difference is a, a urologic oncologist just has more training in that area. Um, so I I think in in complicated cases it can be helpful to have that oncology background, but a lot of the prostate cancer cases are straightforward. Um, I think along those lines that kind of Dr. Hansley touched on is is the multidisciplinary approach for early stage prostate cancer can be very helpful to have the radiation and the uh, and the urology groups uh, interacting uh, together um, because a lot of these. Um, are unclear what the best option is. And for the later stage treatments, you can throw the medical oncologist in there too, to have all three urologists, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists interacting together is, 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 can be helpful for complicated cases. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, another question. Um, uh, oh, all right, sorry about that, just my, moved my mouse. Um, what sort of tests can I expect uh, as far as monitoring uh, the progression of uh, the disease if I'm being actively uh, followed? What uh, what tests can I expect? Yeah, is this for the active surveillance? What are active what are the tests yeah. to expect? Yeah. Yes. So so the the main two are going to be the the rectal exam and the PSA test. And you're getting the PSA test tw twice a year, and you're getting the rectal test once to twice a year. The the Two additional tests that sometimes we need to do, but we don't always, is the uh, MRI and a repeat biopsy. I would say on average for patients who go on active surveillance that they're getting an MRI maybe once every few years, uh, three or four years. And the biopsy, uh, on average, we do about one repeat biopsy every five years. That means some patients might have two in five years and some patients never have a repeat biopsy again but about one repeat biopsy over a five-year period is, is, should be expected. Okay, so, uh, so they're basically uh, they're, they're well followed throughout the process. Yeah, you're followed very closely and, and it's, it's, it is really important to know that you're gonna need to be followed twice a year. Um, and if you stick with that twice a year following, it's a very, very safe approach. And as I tell patients, if we need to do, if we find some some progression and need to do treatment, we'll be treating actually years before it's probably necessary. That's how far in advance we would be from when the cancer would be dangerous. So as long as you're not missing your appointments, you're you're plenty safe with this approach. Okay. Which is something that kind of goes back to one of our previous questions, where it was asked, uh, "I don't feel comfortable waiting for this period of time." Um, Active surveillance is only offered uh, with the with the understanding that you will be followed throughout the process. Yeah, so, uh, we if would any only changes immediately. We'll fix it. Yeah, we would only offer it to that that patient that we're confident it's safe and that we if we find something changed that we would be able to trigger treatment years before it would be necessary. Okay, all right, thank you. I have um, time for I think two more 
uh, excuse me, uh, one is um, something called, uh, what is your opinion of the, uh, the cipher biopsy? And I'll, I guess I'll put that out to both of you. Uh, I had to actually look it up to see what that was. Are you familiar with that? I'm not. Mike, are you? The, are you talking about the decipher, the testing on the biopsy? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm assuming that's the decipher. That's, that's what you're Yeah, decipher. That's one of the ones Eric mentioned in that in his biomarkers. Yeah. Um, I don't routinely use that. I mean, you know, some of those are somewhat controversial as the, the effectiveness, and uh, a lot of it comes down to cost as well. Um, I mean, I don't know. You, you don't use it, do you, Eric? No. Um that's that's not an active surveillance window, but um, that has shown efficacy in other management areas of, of uh, prostate cancer, and it is one of the uh, more promising of, of the group, but the major problem there, I just want to kind of emphasize again, because it was thrown in at the end of the talk kind of quickly, but those tests have not shown an advantage over just what the doctor, they don't add anything um, to the decision-making for a doctor who has access to a lot of different um, uh, uh, tests like MRI, like PSA, uh, like knowing the patient's age and how the PSA has changed over time. Um, it probably doesn't add that that much. The tests, the, the research they did that showed it was promising weren't looking, weren't considering that a doctor has access to all these other things to make a decision. It's, it's, it's complicated. I think that the best way to say is um, it hasn't been shown convincingly to, to make a difference. That's the best the bottom line. And so people generally are not using it. But okay. I always, any of those biomarkers, I will always consider in a, in a real complicated situation where I tell the patient, it's unclear in your case. That, that's pretty rare, but there are cases where it's just unclear what their risk is. That can those markers can be helpful in the, in those minority situations. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the time remaining, I just have uh, one last question. Uh, what types of outreach uh, does Roswell or Buffalo Medical Group uh, do in the uh, Black communities? This morning. This morning. Name the man up. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, Roswell has has events throughout the year that they that they reach out. I I'm just familiar with the the uh, urology um, uh, that uh, urology events that I've taken part in. So of course, as as Mike's saying, this event, but we also have the um, the uh, car um, what's, cruising what's, for a cure. Cruising for a cure. Yeah, um, um, yeah, unfortunately, we didn't, we weren't able to do it this year with the, with the COVID, but it's typically in the fall each year in September. Um, something to look out for where uh, we invite folks out uh, to to uh, look at um, classic cars for those who have an interest in old kind of antique cars, and also get screened, free screen at the same time. And uh, I, I believe Man Up is is a is a big part in in helping that happen every year. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's uh, yeah that's been uh, one of our flagship uh, events that we uh, uh, co uh, co work on with uh, Roswell Park. Uh, it would have been our tenth year. Yeah. Had uh, COVID not happened. Yeah. Um, so you, we you'll, are. Um, you'll find me there every year too. I've I've been there every year. It's a great event. Okay. Um, I um, I appreciate uh, appreciate uh, you both. Uh, we are just about out of time, and um, we're going to get ready to segue into our next uh, segment, which is advanced disease. And uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hensley and Dr. Kaufman, uh, thank you both very much for your time. We'll be talking. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Bye-bye. Take care. Okay. Okay. Uh, I um, well, here we are at the uh, advanced disease section and uh, I want to introduce to you uh, 
Dr. Kershu Guru. He's the uh, chair and professor of oncology, surgery, and neurology at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. And this morning, he'll be speaking on early disease. Welcome, Dr. Guru. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, I have been uh, listening to uh, the conversation which was going on between Dr. Hansley and Dr. Kaufman. Uh, it's incredibly important for people to understand that uh, uh, all those things uh, form a much bigger, important uh, piece of the uh, <clears throat> uh, piece of this because a lot of patients uh, don't reach the stage where they see Dr. Cattle and me. Uh, a lot of patients with prostate cancer now are uh, watched under active surveillance. In fact, one of the pioneers in active surveillance work uh, at grassroots level has been uh, the consortium, uh, very well conceived by uh, our own Dr. Kettle uh, about uh, almost two decades back. And he has done incredible community service for prostate cancer patients and survivors. And also I heard people talk about the man up thing. So very uh, exciting work uh, with Cruising for Cure also, so we're very proud. So the topic you have given me is uh, how to improve urinary continence and sexual function. What are the new technical advances? Uh, I know a lot of people hear about prostatectomy and the procedure. A lot of people convince people that anybody can do a prostatectomy. Yes, it's a procedure a lot of people do, uh, but the differentiating factor here is that uh, there are specific people who have especially spent a lot of time uh, working on this procedure and kind of fine tuning this and doing it well. So uh, if we can move the next slide, please. So what I have done is a lot of people talk about nerve preservation and saving the nerves and how do you uh, kind of prevent the nerve from damage and make sure that there is no thermal injury or kind of manual manipulation of the nerves. Uh, the distance between the prostate edge and the nerves is only three to four millimeters. So we have to be very careful. We came up with this technique of using saline to dissect the nerves off and it has kind of evolved over the years with us. Next, please. And uh, what is the modification we have right now? The modification we have is that uh, the endopelvic fascia, which is kind of the fascia, we leave it intact. We also do not cut the dorsal venous complex, which is basically the blood supply going up and around the prostate and we leave the ligaments, uh, ligaments intact and preserve them. Uh, why? Because we feel that the mechanism of urinary control is dependent on a well-orchestrated pelvis or pelvis. What is pelvis for common people? Pelvis is basically, if you took your two fingers and you put them on your hip bones on the side and you draw a triangle like a bowl from the two hip uh, bone fingers across your belly all the way down to your tip of your penis is like a bowl of pelvis. This pelvis is made up of multiple things. The prostate sits in the middle of it. The urethra is attached to it. The bladder is attached to it. And for somebody, anybody with or without prostate cancer to control urine, there is a well orchestrated mechanism which happens to hold the urine back. And we have used some new techniques to kind of make this better. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the old technique, which probably you can see in a lot of videos, people used to almost kind of peel off the prostate from everything and dissect it away and uh, kind of take it out. And you will see this in a lot of videos by some experts. On the right side, if you see the video, a lot of it is covered and we try to preserve a lot of things intact so that we don't open things. The urethra is not well seen um, because we now can do these things better. We can see things better. That leaves behind a mechanism which is completely intact. Next. So we're gonna play a little video and if you could just pause the audio on this and uh, play the video for me. So this is about six, seven minutes of video. I know a lot of patients want to see what happens inside. And uh, that is what we are gonna show right now here. This is, I'm gonna run through a different things like what we really do here is that Initially, the bladder, if you're looking at a patient down uh, their belly button, the top of this is the belly button, the top of your screen. We basically have to release the bladder off the abdominal wall to get into this space inside called the pelvis where the prostate is kind of sitting in the center of it. So we kind of release that. We kind of make sure that the bladder has been kind of almost pushed backwards and released for us to get access to the prostate. And once that is done, 
we prepare the prostate. The prostate, like I said, is, look at this, it's covered with a lot of fat, it's hidden underneath. The little notch on the top is your pubic bone, and uh, you basically have to release it from all of this tissue, make sure that this is done properly. And once you release that, the prostate kind of almost exposes itself. So you can see here that the prostate is exposed and it's kind of released. Once that is exposed, we kind of separate the prostate from the bladder. Below towards the bottom of your screen is the bladder and the prostate is in the front. And you will see with, this is very intricate surgery. It's all connected to each other. You see the catheter going through the prostate. And once you release that, you kind of have to separate the bladder. Now this separation, uh, our own Dr. Kaufman has a technique of preserving the urethra. He likes that technique. I use a different technique, but that's kind of also taken very well and he has excellent results. Um, I have slightly different approach because we were trained in two different schools. And you can see here, the prostate is slowly getting separated from the bladder. And once they're separated, you kind of have to take those seminal vesicles out. That's why when people talk about prostatectomy, they don't have any ejaculation because these ejaculatory ducts are separated and they are kind of um, dissected off uh, and kind of left <clears throat> uh, to have no ejaculation, even though the feeling of ejaculation is there. So you can see here, we have kind of almost separated those ejaculatory ducts and we are getting underneath the prostate to kind of separate it. And that's kind of our goal here to make sure that that's kind of completely peeled off. Once you have peeled off that, now the most important thing are the nerves. And if you see here, this is saline. A lot of people use current and dissection. You see here, we have used saline. This is just no regular saline like water. You basically use that to dissect your nerves away. And if you see here, once you use the saline, it becomes much, much more easier. The planes are kind of peeled. And if you see that, that the planes kind of open up nicely. And once that dissection has been done on both sides, and we do that dissection on the right side and on the left side, you kind of peel these. What is below this instrument is all that area which contains all the nerves. And these nerves have to be peeled away from the edge of the prostate. The, dis the distance between the prostate and those edges is just three millimeters. You see a little bit of bleeding there. It's not clear because I use very little cautery to basically control it because I don't want to traumatize the nerves. So you can see here, I'm separating. This clip is applied to the major blood supply to the prostate. And we kind of slowly dissect everything off and peel off. It becomes easier if we have used our technique of using saline to kind of dissect this away. So once that is done, you can see the blood supplies to the prostate are getting controlled. These are the blood supplies from below and the side and the nerves and everything you can see are far and behind and we have separated them. And this is done on both sides of the prostate. We make sure that kind of this continues to happen and we peel off the prostate, sometimes being very close to it because you have to make sure that those nerves are peeled off. Now, if this is a patient we are preserving the nerves on, if this was a patient who had high grade disease, we would not be disclosed. Uh, the only reason we are disclosed is because we want a patient has low grade disease and we want to preserve their sexual function to the maximum. And once that is done, we also continue to do a hydrodissection on the other side. Like I said, that it is on both sides and we kind of peel this away. And once we peel this away, we make sure that this is completely peeled. And um, you, as you can watch in the video, because of the hydro dissection, it is much, much more easier for us to kind of separate these two areas and kind of peel them. And this continues to happen on both sides till the prostate like completely becomes separated. And I will show you other than this, and you see this blood, blood supply has been controlled. Other than using hydro dissection or the saline, we also basically release these nerves and relate, control the blood supply to these to the prostate to make sure that that is happening and the prostate is kind of released off this and the nerves are saved. And you see a big chunk of the nerves and all that. I do not open a lot of tissue. And if you see in the front, instead of cutting these veins which go on top of the prostate, I basically release them almost shaving them off the edge of the prostate 
so that I can preserve that complex. And this is one of the things which we have started doing, I have started doing, and that has kind of led uh, this steps, these steps are very important. I preserve all of that and make sure that I am away from the prostate, that I don't leave behind prostate. You can see that I'm almost skiving at about a millimeter or two millimeters on top of this. These are the major blood supplies, the hair. Uh, I'm shaving it off, but I'm not cutting through it. And you can see it's kind of peeled off, off the prostate. And this is kind of a technique which over the last four or five years we have developed and has shown good results. I'm gonna share quickly with you guys. Um, you can see here, uh, this is kind of being done and uh, uh, I am peeling this off to, the, to a point where you will see that uh, the prostate is separated, but the nerves and the dorsal venous complex, the puboprostic fascia, all of it is kind of preserved and uh, very, very important. Uh, the instruments at this video are magnified about seven to 10 times. So you see something very big. Technically, if you can imagine and you fold and roll your hands together, the size of that space is the size of your fist. So it's kind of very narrow space, but it's magnified because the robot, you see this is a stitch we are using to control the blood supply. And once you control the blood supply, you can very well see that we have preserved all that structures and we have preserved all the nerves uh, which makes this operation a much, much better um, technique results for our patients. And you can see here, now the final thing, it is cut off the urethra and this, we preserve the urethra as much as I can. I don't dissect it further. Um, I know Dr. Kaufman has a different, slightly different technique. So he uses that. I do not dissect further into the prostate. And then finally, we kind of close the bladder and attach it to this and uh, if I can go to the next slide, please. Next slide. So when we looked at, we matched the patients who did not undergo this technique, the non-pelvic floor preserving versus the preserving, they were similar patients. Next slide. So their operative times were, was slightly higher for non-pelvic preserving because that time we did not have the technique down. Now we just take uh, less time, about two hours to complete the whole operation. Blood loss is similar in both of them. Next. When you look at the oncological outcomes, which in these cases are several years, they are similar on both the patients. There is very low number of recurrences and uh, the margin rate is also similar. Next, please. This is what is important that if you look at the non-pelvic floor sparing, 65% um, had zero pads. And in pelvic sparing, this technique, 80% had zero pads. And one security pad was in 95% if we did the sparing. So that is very, very good. And uh, even though the baseline shim score was lower, they were able to recover. Next slide. You can see here the biochemical recurrence. The technique was not uh, different. Next slide. So social continence, you can see in this slide very well that the social continence basically shows that uh, uh, the difference between the two is incredible, that within three to six months, we are at 90, uh, 87%. And it is a big difference from previous technique where it was only at 53%. Next. Meanwhile, the full no pad thing, the difference is again, significantly different from what we used to do before. Next. And also, if you look at this slide kind of shows your sexual function and all that, this, this recovery is at about 55 to 60% in my hands. I don't claim to have 90% recovery because I feel patients start at that age have a lower recovery and slower recovery in this. Next slide. Thank you so much. Uh, this was just a video I wanted to show people to get an idea of what we do and the advances we have done in the technique and, and have kind of moved the field forward. Uh, I'm looking forward to any questions or any comments. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Guru. Uh, I just re re want to take a moment just to thank uh, both uh, West Her Automotive Group and also Roswell Park uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center. As we uh, continue with uh, this segment, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Kettle. He is the uh, Chair and Professor of Oncology and radiation medicine at the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. He'll be speaking this morning on radiation. 
Uh, welcome, Dr. Kemp. And your microphone's off. Thank you, Richard. And if I can have the first slide, please. So as the previous presenters discussed, prostate cancer is a quite common cancer in uh, men here in the United States. And as physicians, uh, when we uh, see patients uh, with uh, prostate cancer, we look at a number of characteristics such as the PSA, how fast the PSA is climbing, if it's climbing at all, the PSA density, which is a PSA divided by the size of the prostate gland, the examination, whether or not there's any nodules felt uh, on examination, any imaging studies done. We look at the biopsies to determine the Gleason grade, the Gleason score. We're interested in determining how many cores are positive, the percent core positive, and how much grade four or five, which is more aggressive, is involved within these uh, cores. We also take a look at the patients themselves. How old are they? What's their life expectancy? Do they have any comorbid uh, uh, medical issues uh, that may play into any recommendations that follow? My focus today is on early stage prostate uh, cancer and many patients have options when deciding if they need to be treated and if so, how best to proceed. Treatments not only include the surgical option, but radiation, cryotherapy, hormones, radioactive seeds, et cetera. And what was previously discussed because of the complexity of this, it's important to have a multidisciplinary team reviewing uh, these cases and coming up with the best or a, uh, a combination of best approaches that we can then share with, uh, with our patients. Multidisciplinary teams not only include the radiation oncologist and urologist, but also the pathologist. If there's any change in pathology, uh, we review that. Radiologist and, uh, and medical oncologist. Here at Roswell Park for the last 20 years, every case seen here automatically goes to peer review. We host these every other week. This is a shout out to Man Up because us too has representation uh, at these meetings and certainly uh, any representation from Man Up going forward, uh, they're certainly invited. We do these uh, meetings every other week, Tuesday morning. After the review, a letter is sent to the uh, referring doctor team and to the patient regarding the, uh, the recommendations from that review. The reason pathology is important is because based on the data here, 30% of all pathology we read here, the Gleason score changes, 15% significant to actually alter uh, treatment recommendations and 3% actually do not show uh, prostate cancer at all. So I would put a, a major focus on, it's extremely important as a first step to have pathology reviewed to verify the Gleason score uh, as that functions into the next step, which is treatment options. Next slide. So we follow national guidelines here. Uh, we are part of the NCCN, National Comprehensive Cancer Network. These provide guidelines for all, uh, pro, uh, for all cancer sites. Prostate cancer is one of them. Next slide. Next slide. And the NCCN breaks it down into what we call risk groups, very low risk up to high risk. And as previously mentioned, patient characteristics are extremely important because this helps us place them into a risk group. Not only the PSA and clinical stage, the Gleason score, the volume of disease, the PSA density, et cetera. Furthermore, if you take a look at intermediate risk, that's further broken down into favorable versus unfavorable intermediate risk. Next slide. Next slide. And for favorable intermediate risk, we then further break that down into a patient's life expectancy. Talking to, about options to an 80 year old can be very diff uh, different from discussing treatment options with a 60 year old. An 80 year old who may have underlying medical issues with a life expectancy less than 10 years, observation is preferred. If a patient is younger and healthier and greater than 10 years, 
they have other options, active surveillance as previously discussed, radiation options, external beam, seed implant, or a radical prostatectomy. Next slide. From a radiation perspective, we further define this as definitive treatment. That is patients with an intact prostate that are treated for cure. And the second is post-prostatectomy, patients who've undergone a prostatectomy like Dr. Guru outlined, and then have adverse features following surgery, whether or not it's disease outside the capsule and the surrounding fat or pathologic T3 disease, if the margins are positive, if the seminal vesicles are involved, those patients may require post-prostatectomy radiation therapy to the surgical bed. Salvage radiation is defined as treatment after surgery as well, usually after a year uh, following treatment where the PSA is undetectable, then becomes detectable and starting to rise. In those patients, radiation may be indicated as well in a salvage uh, situation. Next slide. The difficulty here from a patient's perspective is there really hasn't been any randomized trials comparing the two uh, options. Furthermore, when you take a look at the surgical option, I mean, Dr. Guru discussed the robotic approach. Prior to that was an open procedure. From a radiation perspective in the last 10 to 15 years, the delivery of radiation has changed significantly as well. So it's difficult to compare results from 10, 15, even 20 years ago, one versus the other. Again, no randomized studies compared the two. So most of the reports that we present to patients are retrospective analysis. And therefore the decision is based on not only the treatment itself, but discussing the side effects with the patients, the probability of cancer control, the quality of life, and what options exist if the patient fails definitive treatment, whether it be radiation up front or surgery. And this is why I go back to the importance of a multidisciplinary approach, where that all specialists sitting at the table can review the case, render an opinion, and then forward that back to the uh, patient. Next slide. Again, this is a uh, reference uh, to one uh, report the focus of this slide is that the treatment of localized prostate cancer remains controversial, again, because of the lack of uh, prospective randomized control trials. So therefore, a comparison should include issues of cancer control, side effects, quality of life, salvage options that exist following definitive treatment, as well as the cost of the treatment itself. The current available data suggests that these two modalities provide similar rates of cancer control at 10 years, and therefore the choice of treatment should be based on toxicity and quality of life. Now, our personal bias here at Roswell Park is we typically lean more towards surgery for patients who are younger and healthier, reserving radiation as a adjuvant or salvage treatment for patients who fail surgery whereby we, we, we rely more on the radiation for patients who are a little on the older side, based on, again, the cancer control rates at uh, 10 years being equivalent, but longer term data, that being 15, 20, going up to 30 years uh, is non-existent. Next slide. The advantages of radiation uh, therapy, again, it's not invasive. Dr. Guru showed you that six minute video clip we call that more invasive, it's a surgical procedure. From a radiation perspective, patients come in daily, typically five and a half weeks of treatment. They lay on the couch that's there in the picture and the linear accelerator, which is the machine uh, towards the right there, rotates around the patient, giving localized treatment to the areas at risk. We determine the areas at risk based on their prognostic factors. Some patients may only need the prostate and the margin treated. Other patients may need the prostate and seminal vesicles treated. And a third may need uh, pay, uh, their uh, pelvic lymph nodes treated if their probability of pelvic lymph nodes are relatively high. 
As I mentioned, the outcomes are similar to surgery, although logistics of treatment and side effects differ. Patients tolerate the radiation treatment relatively well, and therefore there's a minimal impact on their quality of life. Next slide. Now, the disadvantages of radiation therapy is a time commitment. Our typical standard dose fractionation here is delivered over a course of uh, five and a half weeks. Now, the treatment is only 10 to 15 minutes a day, Monday through Friday, but it is a time commitment over those five and a half weeks of treatment. There also may be some irritative symptoms, especially towards the end of treatment, some increased urinary frequency, getting up a little more often at night to, uh, to urinate, a little burning or stinging towards the, end of, uh, towards the beginning of urination that occurs towards the end of treatment. There may be also some rectal irritation and, uh, and uh, loose stool. However, many of these side effects are short-term, lasting towards the end of treatment and upwards to a month after. But some of these side effects can be more longer term. And one of the major side effects long-term can be rectal irritation that may cause some rectal bleeding and irritation of the, uh, the bladder wall. And this is why it's important when we do deliver radiation therapy, we do it to the best of our ability. Next slide. And the goal from a radiation perspective is to focus the radiation at the area of at risk, minimizing excess dose to the normal surrounding tissue. So in the picture in the top left, you can see that the prostate is shaded in there in the red with the margin surrounding that. And this is a picture of the isodose distribution and you can see that the dose pattern there is treating the prostate and the margin around the prostate. The gray circle just below the prostate is the rectum, and you can see how we can carve dose off the rectum. The white structures on either side of the prostate are the femoral heads, and you can see that doesn't receive much in the way of any dose uh, at all. The bottom right picture is a lateral projection, and you can see in this picture the dose distribution to the prostate and the seminal vesicles. Just to the top right of the prostate is the bladder in gray, and you can see that the dose distribution to the bladder is minimal. Posterior or to the left of the prostate is the rectum, and you can see some gas bubbles there. And you can see the rectal dose is uh, minimal as well. So treatment planning and treatment delivery is extremely important uh, when we deliver a course of radiation over the time of five and a half weeks. Next slide. As far as dose fractionation, per national guidelines, moderately hypofractionated is now the preferred approach. This is typically treated in 25 or 28 fractions, 26 fractions, or 20 fractions. Throughout the country, much higher dose fractionation is used. We use that conventional fraction, but currently there's no data to support that there's any difference in outcome or side effect, and therefore the national guidelines prefer the moderately hypofractionated course over conventional or ultra hypofractionation, ultra meaning that this is delivered in five fractions. Next slide. So I know that uh, we have a few minutes uh, for questions for both Dr. Guru and myself. Again, going back, we do review all cases here with both pathology review and a case review during the multidisciplinary conference. And again, uh, Richard and to your team going forward, uh, us too participates in this, but we would really like to have representation from your group at the table as well. Once a COVID situation uh, settles down and we can go back to uh, real time in-person meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you both very much, uh, both uh, Dr. Guru and Dr. Cuddle. And Dr. Kell, take you up on your offer. Uh, you, uh, you can bet uh, we'll be there. Thank you for the invite. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there was a uh, wow, really a lot going on in this uh, in this segment here. I, I do have a uh, lot of questions. Um, and uh, one is uh, which which uh, Dr. Kettle you uh, you you answered when you talked about five and a half weeks. 
uh, for the uh, radiation treatment. Uh, this question specifically was uh, for advanced treatment. Yeah, how many days? So five and a half weeks. Uh, was that like 35 treatments? 28 treatments or less. So five and a half weeks is 28 treatments. That's a okay. preferred, that's our standard and has been for a number of years. Conventional treatment is over a course of nine weeks. That's upwards to two months plus. And you can see from a convenience standpoint, five, five and a half weeks is a lot different than nine weeks. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and um, there is um, another question for you, uh, Dr. Kevin. I also have some for you, Dr. Guru. Uh, given that for uh, many men, uh, several options exist for managing prostate cancer, including access, uh, active surveillance, how can a patient decide what's best? Well, I think that when you say what's best, many times yeah. there's many different options. So I think the best thing to do is present yeah. patients with, with options. But as I mentioned previously, the first step is to really determine what risk status they are in. And that really is defined based on their Gleason score and to have the pathology reviewed. I mean, if 30% of all pathology reviewed here changes, that is a key indicator as to what group to place them in and to what then recommend uh, for patients. So it's not unusual when patients come here for second, third, or even fourth opinion, and they may be told many different options, but on review here, some of these are subtracted, some may be added because of that peer review process. Whenever there's a pathology change, we always invite the pathologist to come with the slide to review them so we all see them as a group, so we can verify that why they made the change. Also, if a change is made, our pathologist here reach out to the pathologist who initially read the slide to make sure that they were aware of the, of the change as well in case that they want to amend their report. Okay, thank you. I know that as a patient, I had several opinions myself and it's nice to know that I went, to, I, was, I was ultimately treated at Roswell. As a matter of fact, Dr. Guru was my, uh, my doctor and uh, thank you, uh, still here. Um, but uh, you know, I had, um, it's nice to know I went, I went uh, in front of the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, committee and I was reviewed and uh, I wasn't found to be a radiation patient. And uh, so surgery was an option for me. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Kettle. Uh, Dr. Guru, um, I have a question. Um, um, I don't mean to be frank, uh, but will I uh, really still be able to have intercourse after this? Uh, what is the rehab time and will my wife look at me differently? A very good question because uh, this is one of the major concerns, uh, Richard, and uh, it all depends, number one, on the, you know, kind of the sexual function uh, at present or before surgery of the patient, and number one. Number two, the status of the disease uh, <clears throat> and the location and involvement of the disease, the Gleason grade, like Dr. Uh, Carroll said, um, and then uh, based on that, we kind of preserve the nerves. Uh, that's that's kind of how we set it up. But the second part of the question: Will somebody look at you different? I I don't think so. If you if you take uh, if you take even phil, uh, physiological data after the age of forty, uh, sexual function kind of deteriorates ten percent a year, a decade. So what you have to understand is that with other comorbidities like diabetes and other conditions. Uh, sexual function is on the decline with age. Um, what has to be done is that a proper rehab program has to be implemented and rehab prog programs don't just end at or with surgery, they basically begin afterwards. And this is true for um, all the treatments. With rehab programs um, start from as early as <clears throat> psychological intervention, as early as pills, oral pills, or up to all, all the way up to putting implants. And we have a, uh, at Roswell a dedicated uh, now a faculty who basically is running a um, survivorship sexual health program. So that kind of uh, gives more kind of dedication and robust and time for these patients so that they come in and they just hear exactly what the problems are with this. Yes, so I don't uh, agree that people will look at you different. It just is a pathway to kind of get back to rehabilitation. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for that. I have one more, uh, a couple more for both of you. Um, Dr. Guru, um, 
This is about the video you showed. Uh, is it common for that much fatty tissue to surround a prostate gland? Uh, yes, it depends on the uh, body weight, uh, body mass index, uh, and the kind of the kind of the quality of life of the patient before they went into the thing. Uh, it is uh, de dependent on these factors. Yes, there is fat, and it always takes time for us to completely clean it up properly. Okay, because uh, I know that there is a uh, there's a question here about the also uh, uh, diet, and I guess I can ask you both. Um, uh, to get to a point where we are at advanced disease, uh, is there a role that diet plays in this? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, diet is very important and uh, uh, the more fitter they are, the it, it plays a role in everything, in uh, mm -hmm. overall health. So uh, <clears throat> it almost can change your category of treatment based on how fit you are. Like Dr. Carroll was saying, you have to look at the overall picture. And I heard this was also mentioned by Dr. Hansley and Dr. Um, Kaufman, especially in active surveillance in Dr. Kaufman's talk, a lot of where you get placed is dependent on your survival. So diet is very important, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Dr. Kettle, um, as far as the multi-disciplinary uh, multi, uh, uh, team that's assembled, uh, can, you, uh, can you tell us who is all in the room and what are they doing? So besides the uh, urologist and radiation oncologist, we also have the physician assistants for both teams. Uh, we have pathologists. Again, they come with the slides to review if there's been change. Radiologists to assist with any imaging uh, that needs to be uh, addressed. In addition to that, we also have patient advocates uh, at the table as well. Anywhere from one to three patient advocates are sitting at the table. Patients' names are blinded, so there's confidentiality there. That they see the same information, they hear the same discussion uh, in the room. And uh, that can be helpful that they can see that it truly is a multidisciplinary approach to come up with. Uh, the best recommendation or recommendations for the uh, patient. In addition to those in the room, we also have uh, support groups within the institution here that includes a survivorship that Dr. Gu mentioned, dietitians, et cetera, that can also assist with how best to um, manage patients both during treatment and for the remainder of their life. Okay. Uh, this is also adding on to what you just said. Uh, how quickly are the decisions made on, uh, on, a, on, on various cases? Uh, so you have somebody up uh, on, a, on a slide and you're discussing it. Uh, do, you ever, do you ever get to a place where um, there's a disagreement? Well, typically if there's any disagreement, we vote. Um, uh, however, if there's a disagreement, uh, it usually is it's really not a disagreement. It's, it's usually how many options to place in the letter that goes back to the patient and their referring doctor. If we, you know, uh, if we have a majority that recommend one approach over the other, we would actually put prefer or recommend one over the other in the letter as well. If there's okay. no strong preference of one or the other, we would say, for instance, all options, list the options, and then state it's really the patient's choice. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, doctor. Yes, Dr. Guru. I just want to add one more comment here uh, in kind of almost supporting this whole vision uh, Dr. Cattle had 20 years back. Uh, it is very important for patients, and it gives you a big comfort as a family member to see that if they came to see me as a surgeon, that I'm not just uh, selling them surgery. They go to a consensus meeting where a multidisciplinary approach is done. There is an equal vote for surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and other members in the team. And that voting is basically what's put in the letter. Patient's name so kind of is removed. So you don't have that bias that what you want for the patient. You're objectively looking at the patient. And there are different levels and <clears throat> different people who have been trained at different places. So what that adds is that you get that whole flavor of that variability. So there's, uh, as uh, some of the questions here, there doesn't seem to be a, uh, a rush to do one thing over the other. There is a, a lot of due diligence 
uh, that's, uh, that's performed to, to arrive at a decision that's best interest of the, uh, uh, for the patient and not uh, the respective uh, departments that may treat. We tell patients that there's typically no rush to come up with a recommendation. We wanna make sure that it's done right because really what's important is that first step. Once the treatment is delivered, it's hard to take it back. So it's important to have all these steps and then the final recommendation. And that may take a couple of weeks, but from a patient's perspective, there's no rush. Treatment doesn't need to be started uh, once a diagnosis is made. Yeah, and that's actually very comforting to a lot of folks who feel that there is uh, oftentimes a rush and uh, you know, to uh, force them to make a decision. Having that time to actually reflect and think, re review the material, uh, talk to the doctors is extremely important time. So uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Guru, uh, one more question for you, and that is about nerve damage. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, the, this is uh, going back to the video again. There's a lot going on there. And uh, I'm just curious, how do you make a decision on whether or not you save uh, nerves? Because you mentioned nerve sparing. Yes, uh, the video they saw was complete nerve spare. But again, we go back to what uh, is the status of their sexual function before surgery, the status of their prostate cancer, where it is, the location, the sides, and the grade of the prostate cancer, the Gleason grade, and then also their overall health and their capability for kind of preservation and need for it. And these all factors come into play for us to weigh the risks and benefits of this. God forbid if there's a Gleason 10 and we have a person who needs nurse sparing, we usually tell them we can't do a nurse sparing, but we could depend on the post-surgical modalities of getting sexual function back. If there's a Gleason 6, like you saw in that video, where you can really go to closer to the prostate and on one side, there is no disease. So you can literally shave it very close and save the maximum amount of nerves. So it depends on multiple factors. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And Dr. Kettle, one more, uh, we're getting close to end here. Um, what role does a radiation, a radiation therapist uh, play in treatment? So radiation therapist is a specialist who actually runs a linear accelerator. They do this under the direct supervision of a radiation oncologist. Uh, again, a radiation therapist is a, uh, multiple years of, uh, of training. Uh, here at Roswell Park, we employ uh, 20 therapists here. Uh, we have junior and senior. Anyone that's new out of uh, training requires a five-year um, uh, position under supervision by a senior therapist before they transition into that senior role. So it's an extremely important position. Uh, these are the people that the patients see every day that they come in for uh, uh, treatment. Uh, they're viewed as family. Uh, five and a half weeks is a long haul. And so the relationship between the team is, is very strong. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that. I know that uh, we, uh, we're not gonna have time to really get another one in. I want to make sure we can uh, we can actually keep the program on time. Thank you both uh, for your uh, valuable information. This was awesome. Um, uh, thank you both. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Bye. Richard, and a great program. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, as we get ready to dig into uh, survivorship, I wanted to thank the, um, the University of Rochester uh, Wilmot Cancer Center. And I want to introduce um, Dr. Uh, I got it this time. <laughs> Van Van Hoosen. Uh, Dr. Van Van Hoosen. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Medicine, uh, Hematology, Oncology at Wilmot uh, Cancer uh, Institute, University of Rochester Medical Center. He's going to be speaking uh, this morning on uh, metastatic disease. Um, Dr. Van Van Hoosen, please apologize for uh, what I've done to your name. <laughs> Take it away, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to participate in this program. And, and you did good with my name. So, but I'm glad to be right. here. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle advanced disease and at least uh, give kind of an outline of, of, of how it develops and a, a little bit about treatment and, and new options. And then I think Dr. Chad is going to talk more about uh, some more advanced treatments. But um,
So you got the screen okay? All right. So um, I think, as we know, uh, prostate cancer, I just wanted to go back in the history of, of the disease. We know that it's a cancer that is it dominantly spreads to bone. In fact, you know, 90% of the patients sometimes, at least in the past, that was the only side of spread of disease. As patients have lived longer and, and we've developed new treatments, uh, the, site, the spread to other organs is a little bit more common, but still really, really a bone, a bone dominant disease. And if you look at the history of uh, this disease, it really dates back to 1940 when a Dr. Huggins um, be became involved and was looking at uh, this disease in, in, in uh, dogs and found that taking away testosterone helped um, uh, treat this disease. And, and back in the 1940s, when we had limited options, uh, bone, bone metastatic disease really can be quite painful. And this was really a, a very innovative advance and, and really helped uh, patients uh, symptomatically uh, by taking away testosterone. And so a really great advance at that time. But as we look back, um, one of the things is that because of the effectiveness of this treatment, I think our treatment still really, really evolves around um, this approach as this is the first approach for treating metastatic disease. And I've always kind of hoped, can we find other options and other uh, treatments? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, that option later. Um, if we look at just the, you know, the endocrine, the endocrine system, um, obviously, uh, castration, which was the first treatment, takes away testosterone from the testicles. But the newer, the newer shots and injections like luprolide and goserelin um, really work on the pituitary gland, which stops the, the signal to the testicles for, the, for s stopping the production um, of testosterone. And we, we've known um, that really testosterone interacts with the prostate um, in normal prostate function, but that's maintained in cancer. And again, taking away testosterone uh, kind of starves the cancer, of one of the things essential for its growth. But as time went on, what we learned is that that treatment would not last and that there's a variety of reasons that prostate cancer continues to grow, even though the response initially to taking away testosterone is excellent, it almost universally fails, um, sometimes in a year, sometimes three, four, or five years. And that's, that's really for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is that the adrenal glands make a low level of uh, androgen-like hormones that the cancer learns to start to feed on. And these drugs of the past um, um, were often added uh, to uh, the Lupron and we'd see additional effects and additional benefits. And then more, what we also know is that because of how the Lupron and Galerzerlin work, they also, they initially cause an increase in testosterone before it goes down. Um, in that by blocking, by using a drug like flutamide or bliclutamide, which blocks blocks the receptor at the cancer level, you can prevent that flare. And so there's always been a concern with Lupron, especially in patients that have pain related uh, to their prostate cancer, will that, that pain get worse before it gets better? And that actually led to the development of the Degarolex or Firmagon, which just automatically shuts off testosterone production and prevents that flare response. And this is just uh, talking a little bit more about why Lupron can be so effective at the start, but why does it ultimately stop working uh, in the setting of metastatic disease? And like I mentioned, its production um, by, by other organs, um, um, the cancer alerting to feed on smaller uh, levels of testosterone, um, mutations in the tumor, the tumor can develop mutations that actually learn to adapt and actually feed on drugs like uh, casedex or biclutamide. Um, and then there can be a co cohort of cells that are just resistant, um, um, in some cases, just resistant to uh, hormonal therapy from the start. One of the, one of the things that we've known is, is that um, prostate cancer um, 
inherently can learn to develop its own testosterone. And it does that through a cholesterol, through a, uh, 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 a cascade of steps, um, um, converting cholesterol ultimately into testosterone. So in essence, learning to feed itself, and that's it's the issue with uh, cancer, um, um, all, all kinds of cancers, it always uh, it seems to keep a step ahead of us. And so we have to be, a, be, be cognizant of those changes and, and develop new therapies. And one of the, the, the therapies that has been, the recent therapies that have been added uh, to the base hormonal therapy has been drugs that have targeted, again, the ability to, to um, take away um, testosterone from the cancer. One of those drugs is Zytiga or Abiaterone, um, which again, just prevents that from the cancer from making its own testosterone. There are other drugs that have been developed like enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolumamide, um, all fairly, fairly new agents that again, all work by either stopping testosterone production or preventing how the cancer are, are preventing testosterone from interacting uh, with the cancer itself. And so what the, one of the biggest advances in recent years in treating metastatic disease or disease that has spread beyond the prostate and is no longer curable has been to add one of these agents uh, to, uh, to Lupron. Um, um, and uh, th these 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 drugs have been improved in, in that setting. The other approval is adding chemotherapy earlier. Um, all all those all those options have, have have prolonged how long the initial remission is with cancer with prostate cancer once you start hormonal therapy. Um, chemotherapy docetaxel really works different in that. It's, it's really trying to target those cells that are inherently resistant to um, the hormonal therapy uh, treatments. Um, and it is option, again, um, alternatively to uh, just adding a, a, a different pill. These are all in the pill, pill form. So that in the setting of metastatic disease, those have been some of the, the more recent advances of really, really, um, you know, again, trying to build on the fact that this is a tumor that responds, um, that, that requires uh, androgens and male type hormones to, to grow. Um, but really, I think ultimately what we hope is can we find other avenues, can we find other avenues of treatment to treat the disease um, 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 in, in a different way? And ultimately, although these 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 options are 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 clearly effective, clearly effective in controlling the disease for some time, they don't they don't at this point um, um, give a, a curative alternative or option. So I wanted just to speak a little bit about immune therapy. Not that it's it's mainly because immunotherapy in, in other diseases uh, across the spectrum of cancer has really uh, been, been in the forefront of treating metastatic disease. But prostate cancer has really lagged behind um, in this uh, setting. And uh, Dr. Chada may talk a bit about Provenge, which is the vaccine, which is the currently approved immunotherapy for prostate cancer in the gastrate resistance setting. But I think there, there are several reasons why prostate cancer and immunotherapy has not been effective uh, to date. Is one, it's a it's a slower changing cancer with less mutations, and it, um, it appears that uh, the that perhaps the bone, the fact that it spreads to the bone and the environment in the bone, adds a little bit of uh, resistance. Again, immunotherapy is working by cancer's ability to hide from our own immune system and how do you turn back our immune system back on to recognize the cancer is bad. But there's a lot of work, you know, in, in, in especially the setting of um, patients who have early metastatic disease or early PSA recurrence after curative treatment is how can we capture uh, the immune system and how can we turn that back on to help um, uh, fight the cancer and 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 hopefully provide a potential curative uh, result versus um, again what what we can do with um, hormonal therapy is control the disease for a good period of time but have trouble getting rid of it. 
I wanted to actually also to talk a little bit about uh, um, some of the, the 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 novel imaging, which you know the hope is that patients are cured with radiation or cured with their surgery, but prostate cancer is a disease which we know um, it has a tumor marker, the PSA, which if if that starts to go up following curative therapy, we we know the disease is around and it's still present. But we traditionally has have have had significant difficulty uh, finding. Uh, where that disease is at. Uh, standard CT scans and bone scans have trouble uh, locating it when you have a low PSA level. And so I think one of the recent advances is, can we, can we find the disease where it's located earlier? And if we can find it earlier, can we have impact a bigger change? And there's several novel uh, imaging approaches uh, that have been developed, uh, including the C11 acetate, um, that uh, is approved for for other 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 um, uh, indications. It um, is somewhat limited in its ability because it's a very has a very short half life, and so only sites that have the ability to make it on site can use that. So C11 acetate has not uh, become quite as um, um, widespread use. A C11 choline is another. Uh, 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 pet imaging agent with a similar um, problem as far as this, it, it has to be made on site. But F8, F18 uh, flucovine or oximin is the, is the one that is being most widely used at the present time um, and, and can be done uh, at, at, at most institutions. Again, finding a way to, to detect the cancer early when, when you know it's there because the PSA is rising and hopefully it's a more limited limited location. PSMA scan is, is, is using um, a surface marker on the prostate cancer, the prostate uh, specific membrane antigen to locate the cancer. And it's actually, at least what we have right now, probably the best test of, uh, going to be the best test of detecting prostate cancer at an early or recurrent prostate cancer at an early point in time. It, we think, is going to be approved um, uh, hopefully in the next even few months uh, for use. Um, this is just a, a picture of, of uh, um, uh, one of the, the PET scan uh, imaging um, and, and what we 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 can uh, try to do this is this is obviously a patient that has local treatment this is a prostate this is actually showing a lymph node um, uh, uh, around the prostate bed and I think that's where some of these agents have been uh, most helpful is that if if the if the cancer has been cured at the prostate the site of the prostate, but you have local just lymph node disease, can you perhaps target that with radiation or other alternatives and at least impact a chance of cure? And again, that's where I think these images, these these imaging modalities are, are going to be most helpful. This one just shows uh, isolated a lymph node um, in the chest. Um, again, Trying to identify the area, the areas of of, of recurrence earlier. Uh, there's been recent studies that have shown that by targeting these areas with radiation, um, um, uh, uh, the um, cyber knife or the the uh, stereotactic uh, radiation, you can perhaps uh, impact a, a bigger chance of maybe at least delaying the time to needing hormonal therapy or uh, open the door to, 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 in a small percentage of patients, can you eradicate this disease? Um, so, so I think that imaging can um, help find disease earlier. Um, um, by finding it earlier, can you uh, have a bigger chance of at least having a chance to eradicate the disease completely? Um, um, there's 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 studies looking at can you combine radiation with immunotherapy because radiation radiation um, doesn't um, radiation has as synergy in that it expresses immunotherapeutic uh, antigens um, and and perhaps as synergy with those treatments and so I, I think new new things on the on the horizon is hopefully of different ways we can approach the treatment of metastatic disease but. 
And I think I think I'm done there. Um, just last uh, the other the other way, there are new things going on with regard to um, uh, if we could present prevent or figure out why prostate cancer is so specific in going to the bone. Can we prevent that? And can we can we impact uh, have a greater impact on the development of metastatic disease as well? And a lot of a lot of different uh, things go, looking at and going on in that that arena as well. But but. Um, uh, I think that that's it. So, yeah, well, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Van uh, Van Hudson. I I don't know if I, I put like a little uh, accent on that. I don't know if that was correct, but <laughs> Dr. Uh, uh, Peter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're thank you very welcome. Much. You're welcome. Yeah. I just I also wanted to uh, thank uh, uh, as we transition into uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chada uh, Roswell Park. And uh, we'll go ahead and we'll get, uh, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Gu, uh, Dr. Rachata. Uh, he's the uh, professor of oncology, uh, chief uh, medical, clinical chief of uh, uh, January uh, uh, Medicine at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, he'll be speaking this morning on uh, castrate uh, resistance disease. Uh, Dr. Chata. Yeah, away. thank you, Richard. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, Peter is always a tough act to follow, but, you know, I'll try to do my best. We, we've always paired up intentionally because he has a complicated last name and I have a complicated first name. So between the two of us, we can always keep it simple. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'm primarily going to be talking about castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And I think probably the first thing is to try to define what we mean when we say this. Uh, I, I think in a nutshell, it doesn't mean that the tumor has, the that the tumor has stopped responding to testosterone. It just means there are other sources of testosterone which are equally important and are turning the cancer on. So again, this is just a cartoon which uh, traces the disease continuum in prostate cancer. Uh, you know, the earlier speakers uh, kind of talked in this area. You know, uh, Peter covered uh, metastatic disease and I'm going to be talking about castrate resistant disease. And again, uh, castrate resistant can either be non-metastatic or can be metastatic. I think if you turn the clock back about 10 years ago, once men developed metastatic castrate resistance disease, which is here, uh, median survival was less than two years. And I think in the last decade, we've made you know, significant advances that now it's more like three to five years. Again, that's median. In some folks, it can be even longer. So I, I think this is probably the, the single most important slide. Uh, testosterone is the main fuel that fuels prostate cancer. The primary source of testosterone is the testes. And this probably makes up over 95% of testosterone uh, made by the body. But as time goes on, uh, other sources like the adrenal gland and much, much more importantly, the tumor itself uh, whether it be the, the primary tumor, meaning the prostate gland, or wherever it's spread, bone or lymph nodes, these are really very important contributors to making testosterone and fueling the cancer. And I think in the last decade, the, probably the single most important advance has been how do we block this source of testosterone? And that's where the newer treatment comes in. So, so once again, it's not that blocking testosterone in the testes with shots like Lupron or Zolodex is not working. Uh, really what it means is it is not sufficient and you also need to block these other sources. So once somebody is on Lupron continuously, you never really stop uh, because you always have to block the testes. And still the single best thing that we know that blocks the testes other than removing them uh, are shots like Lupron and Zolodex. The, uh, I guess this is probably the second most important slide of the talk. So everything in the majority of prostate cancer, right, not, nothing is absolute, is really about testosterone, which is the, the pink uh, you know, toggle here, and the androgen receptor, which is the blue toggle here. A and most of why disease continues to progress is either we make too much of testosterone or there is something gone wrong with the androgen receptor that it can act without the testosterone. So typically, you know, in, in typical life, you have testosterone which binds to the androgen receptor and enters the cancer cell. So this whole thing depicts a cancer cell. 
and, and, and this combo, the, the pink stuff and the blue stuff, then goes to the, the, heart of, uh, the heart of the cancer cell or the nucleus, where it turns the cancer on. And you know, this is intentionally a super simplified slide. I've just shown you one other thing. This is called the heat shock protein, which basically shuttles this combination to the nucleus. But again, in real life, there are multiple, multiple molecules, which you know, first take this combination to the nucleus and then help it to turn the cancer on. So again, this, you know, the simple cartoon, you know, really is to underscore the complexity uh, of, of prostate cancer. So then how do we define cascade resistant prostate cancer? It's basically a, a PSA going up or cancer spreading in the bones and the lymph nodes or wherever else, despite castrate serum testosterone levels. So remember when we measure testosterone, what we're really doing is measuring it in the blood. Uh, it really doesn't measure what's made locally at the tumor level. And for definitional purposes, castrate is defined as less than 50 nanograms per deciliter. But there's also another metric, which is nanomolar. So one just has to keep it in mind that, that we are following the right metric. And the other thing we know is that uh, every man who goes on primary hormone therapy or androgen deprivation therapy, which really means blocking the testes, uh, in all of them, eventually, if treated long enough, they will develop gastrate-resistant prostate cancer or CRPC. And the other important point is in 99% of prostate cancer, the androgen receptor, which I showed you in the previous cartoon, is typically always present and functional. So if we break down as to what the reasons for gastrate-resistant prostate cancer are, either one can make too much of androgen from all the different sources. So again, when we use the words testosterone, dehyd dihydrotestosterone, they really are all androgens. Or you can have the androgen receptor, which for a variety of reasons becomes overactive. It can either amplify, uh, it can change its size and become more functional without the presence of androgens. Uh, it can talk to molecules other than androgens, or it can signal via alternate pathways. So, so the androgen receptor is, is not only a complicated protein, it's also pretty promiscuous and can talk to things other than testosterone, which then, then can kind of fuel the cancer. So uh, again, when I said the last decade, the, the two main uh, novel hormonal agents that were developed were Zytiga and Ixtandi. The other name of Zytiga is Abiriteron. Uh, the other name of uh, Ixtandi is Anzalutamide. And, and really, there are two sides of the same coin. Uh, Abiritron blocks androgen production, and no matter where it's coming from, and enzalutamide blocks the androgen receptor. Uh, I think Peter showed you this cartoon in a slightly different manner. So just to again kind of point out, this is where Abiritron works. All testosterone and dihydrotestosterone is derived from cholesterol. And basically what Abiritron does is, or Zytiga does is, it blocks the production of testosterone fairly early on in the pathway. But there is an escape pathway this way, which can also, so it's not, it's not absolute, but it's a pretty good blocker of uh, uh, testosterone production. On the other hand, the Zytiga, again, if you remember, there's testosterone and the diet and the androgen receptor. Uh, so these two bind to the androgen receptor and Xtandi blocks this. So essentially it competes with uh, androgens to bind to the androgen receptor. And this again is the same cartoon. This combination goes to the heart of the cell or the nucleus and turns the cancer on. So this is probably the main place where Xtandi acts, but it can also block this complex going into the, into the nucleus and can also block binding of the complex to genes which turn on prostate cancer. But this is probably the, the main mechanism. So once again, you know, these were the first two drugs developed uh, to, to work on the testosterone and androgen receptor axis. But since then, there have been a number of other drugs, and those are kind of summarized here. So here you have castrate resistant prostate cancer again. Once again, since we do a lot of treatment earlier, uh, you have a significant number of men where the PSA is going up, but the scans are negative, and that's what we mean by non metastatic. But because the PSA is going up despite suppressing the testes, they are called castration resistant. And in the last four to five years, uh, these three drugs are now approved 
for the treatment of non-metastatic gastroid-resistant prostate cancer. So, uh, you know, you recognize Extandia or enzalutamide, and these are really very similar drugs, apalutamide and daralutamide. Uh, so apalutamide is Erlada, and uh, daralutamide is the third drug that was approved in this setting. Now, you know, they have slightly different side effect profiles. So, but, but, but in terms of efficacy, uh, depending on what other comorbidities patients have, all three are actually equally effective. Then moving on to the metastatic setting, again, you know, Peter alluded to Provent or Cipolicil T. This is the immunotherapy, uh, which was first approved for prostate cancer. It actually still remains the only immunotherapy that, that uh, was approved for prostate cancer. And this happened much, much earlier before enzalutamide and abiratron became available. And had they been available, I'm not sure this would have been approved. So I guess uh, Provenge is a useful drug uh, you know, in the right patient, uh, mainly men who don't have very rapidly progressive disease and who don't have widely metastatic disease. But in a slowly rising PSA, low volume metastatic disease, I think this is a, you know, a, a useful intervention. And then again, you recognize enzalutamide abiritron. And before they were approved in this setting, we used to have chemotherapy, which is dositaxol. I mean, this is still available. So really, these are all, you know, in the right patient at the right time. All these are, you know, equally, um, they're all valid options and, and useful drugs to use. Uh, Zometa and denosumab, these are bone agents. Uh, they don't treat the cancer, but they do help with preventing further bone loss and further osteopenia and do decrease the incidence of fractures as cancer goes to the bone. Now in the, in, in patients who have, uh, who are symptomatic, one can either do chemotherapy, again, you'll see Xtandi and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Zytika showing up again. And there's also RAD223 in, in uh, men who have primarily bone disease. So this is like giving, radiation, but it's an intravenous injection, and the radiation homes in uh, to wherever the cancer may be in the bone. And then cabazitaxol is, is second-line chemotherapy. So how best do we sequence all this? You know, I, I think this has been worked out pretty well now. So in men who are castrate resistant, uh, have metastatic disease, but are not symptomatic or have minimal symptoms, we either do Provenge or Extandi or Zytiga. Uh, if they are symptomatic, we use chemotherapy first, uh, and, and this can go subsequently, and after people have failed. So, so the other generic term for enzalutamide Zytiga is called androgen receptor targeted therapy or second line hormonal therapy. So once people have failed this and chemotherapy, that's when we look at cabazitaxel. And RAD223 can either go here or here, depending on whether the cancer is only in the bone or, or is it in bone and elsewhere? So for bone only, this is again a, a useful uh, therapy. But I think the, the big problem that we have now is uh, once we have used the treatments already shown before, uh, men you know, develop refractory CRPC. And this in many ways is a huge challenge. Uh, so if you look at this cartoon, as you this is just a pictorial which shows you even to the naked eye, you can tell as you treat the cancer, it's changing. So uh, people have tried to define this better. And one of the bigger problems now is the so-called small cell cancer for which the treatment of chemotherapy is slightly different. So in newly diagnosed, it's only less than 1%, but once somebody is castrate resistant and refractory, it's almost eight to 10%. And then people have also tried to uh, define certain genetic defects. So far, they have not influenced treatment, but people are kind of working on that. And uh, so the one way to look at this is the more you treat, you change the cancer. So if you look at a cancer cell, you can either develop mutations within the cancer or genetic changes within the cancer. These develop more slowly. This is the blue stuff here. Uh, and it's harder to treat. Or the, the underlying genetic code doesn't change but the cloaking around the tumor change, what we, what we call epigenetics. So that's what the purple curtain or halo is. And uh, this is something which develops more rapidly. And this is actually an area of intense research where people are trying to 
so-called take away, take away the curtain or uncloak the tumor so that you can read the genetic code. So once again, the blue one is a genetic change within the tumor. Uh, the epigenetic, the, the, the curtain around the tumor prevents the genetic code from being read and, and is theoretically more reversible. So uh, this is the androgen receptor. Uh, any gene, so this is the gene which codes the androgen receptor. Any gene has a, a business end uh, and, and then has the end to which the, 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 the testosterone or the androgen binds. So normally this is the whole molecule, but in prostate cancer, you get these called splice variants where you lose where the testosterone binds to. And so, you so even using the drugs doesn't really help block this because now this, uh, this smaller protein or the truncated receptor can turn the cancer on without requiring testosterone. So that's again a big challenge. And so far, we, you know, the people are now developing drugs, which rather than binding to this end of the molecule can now bind to this end of the molecule. So this is called the five prime end, that's called the three prime end. I mean, this, this is just conventionally the way they are named. But the main point of the slide is uh, all the drugs we have work at this end. Now we are trying to develop work, drugs that work at this end. So people have also tried to look at the genetics of cancer. And the main purpose of this slide is the majority of changes are in the androgen receptor, then DNA repair, uh, other signal molecules being repaired. You know, they've also become important. About 15 to 20% of men will have abnormalities in DNA repair uh, as we treat the cancer. Sometimes they're also inherited. And now there are two drugs that have been approved for this. You may have heard the names rocaparib and laparib. So again, refractory prostate cancer you know, is a difficult disease to treat, uh, but we are gradually making progress. And this slide just depicts, this is the primary tumor and, and this is the metastatic tumor. And if you look at the genetics of that, as you can see, uh, the orange bars, uh, you know, they, they show metastatic disease. And as you can see, as you treat the tumor changes. And those are the changes on the left side, which are listed. So again, I think uh, I'll kind of wind up by saying uh, refractory prostate cancer, I, I guess, is the, you know, is the next challenge. I already mentioned the, the PARP inhibitors, rucaparib and rolaparib, which were approved for men where prostate cancer has DNA repair abnormalities. And then all this other stuff is investigational, where you block the androgen receptor with drugs like uh, Extandi. But in addition, you add other stuff like these are the demethylating agents. And then similarly, these are drugs targeting other pathways. I think immunotherapy other than Provenge remains investigational. And there's a lot of work going on to better understand the immune system in prostate cancer and see how we can re-energize or reinvigorate the prostate cancer to, uh, sorry, the immune system to treat the prostate cancer. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention and be happy to take questions. Dr. Uh, both uh, Dr. Chada and uh, uh, Dr. Van uh, Belhusen, uh, I want to thank you both. Um, really interesting topic and we, uh, we do have some questions for you. Actually, this question right now is from both of you, both speaking uh, to both metastatic and uh, castor resistance. So I'll ask you both to uh, uh, speak on this, please. Um, uh, do you know when a therapy is working and when to switch to a new one? I, I, I can start, um, yeah, but sure, um, um, the, the, I mean, I, I think that PSA is really a, a pretty uh, good reflection in most cases um, of uh, response to treatment. And, and generally you see the PSA go down, um, you, you feel like you feel some satisfaction that the disease is responding. Um, it's not a perfect um, measure by any means. And there are cases where PSA, um, is not a good reflection of disease response, but that is often an early indicator of response. And the same PSA going up, you you um, generally feel the disease is start starting to escape what you're doing. But it's also true that it's it's you shouldn't always just jump uh, to change treatment just based on PSA alone, in that sometimes you're still slowing the direct, direct to your disease and, and, and need to incorporate symptoms and, and, and scans as well. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Dr. Chada jump in 
to. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree with Peter. I think it's very important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I, I think any change in treatment has to be deliberate and well thought out. Uh, you know, so not only the PSA, but also looking at what the scans show. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think because remember, we don't have that many drugs available or unique drugs available. So we do need to use them, you know, thoughtfully and sequentially and, and kind of make reasoned decisions surrounding changes of treatment. Okay. Um, thank you both. Um, I have another question. Um, since I, I grew up in the 50s, I'm very leery of becoming involved in clinical trials. Has anything changed to help address this uh, with men of color? And do you recommend taking part in clinical trials to all your patients? And this will go to both of you. So I, I'll take a first crack at that last Peter. Good. So, you know, I, exactly. I, do think, I, I, I do think it's actually very important for two or three reasons. So number one, I, I think whenever somebody is being looked at for a clinical trial, there are kind of multiple hands on deck. There are multiple eyes looking at it. And I think as a rule, we tend to do a more thorough and better job of really looking at every nuance and every aspect of treatment. And the other thing is, I, talk is cheap. So I always encourage people to at least participate in the conversation. And you can always, you know, nobody's ever going to force you to go on a clinical trial and you can always walk away. There's no penalty. But, but I think it's important for both sides not only are we able to impart information in a thoughtful manner, but I think we learn a lot as well when people participate and kind of get to know their concerns and figure out, you know, get better at how to handle those. Peter? Yeah, um, I mean, I agree. I, I think, I think uh, you know, unfortunately in the past, there hasn't been good oversight and, and, and trials were done that probably shouldn't have been done. And, and some of that 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 mistrust is is, is well founded in history and, and I, but I think there are many more eyes on, on clinical trials and clinical trial development now and really trying to outreach onto a more diverse group and trying to understand you know why you know the fears and try to help 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 build the trust and, and help um, you know um, promote that you know we are trying to to do the best thing and the disease isn't always exactly the same you know in 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 other ethnic category and so it's really important that that on um, trials are done in a diverse group of patients so. yeah and that's a big one right there you, you hit on trust and we uh, we all know that there are a lot of historical fears about anyone wanting to enter uh, clinical trials uh, especially when you speak to a men of color so at least I'm glad that uh, that you're uh, you know all conscious of that, and those are the kind of conversations that you have with your patients, um, at least to put them at ease of the need for a clinical trial participation. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I have another one here, and this uh, for both of you, uh, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Vendel uh, Husson um, uh, first. Um, what's the latest data in sequencing oral chemotherapies and IV chemotherapies? So uh, actually, that's a—I mean—that's a great, a great question because we—it's well, one of the You're issues. You're watching, right? <laughs> we, we, one of the issues that we, we, we don't know uh, exactly, you know, when to use and what, you know, with the oral hormonal drugs, um, you know, whether you start with uh, abiaterone or enzalutamide. Um, some some thoughts as well. Do you switch to a chemotherapy next, or there is there is a mutational uh, a mutation called ARV7, which if if you you know that test may help guide whether another oral drug is 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 likely to work or not. Um, but I but I think sequentially there there is there is still some question. Well, what 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 do we do next, or what's the next best choice? Um, I think. Of the agents we have not, right now, if you're going to use Provenge, it's clear that you use that early on. Usually, um, but anyway, I'll let, I'll let, I'll let Dr. Chada jump in on this. Too. Thank you. No, no, no. I mean, I, again, I mean, I think it, it's really a discussion between you know the patient and the provider. Um, uh, you know, the the side effects are slightly different. I, I think if somebody is symptomatic. Uh, has a lot of disease burden. I personally would give chemotherapy an initial shot to get more rapid control, but then it may not work. The downside is always there. 
Though I think in the, in the majority of I, I think the majority of folks do wind up going with the pills, which are hormonal therapy, like the Xtandi or the Zytiga, um, you know, initially. But I, I don't think there's a right answer. Uh, but you know, you could follow either. Okay. I hope uh, to the uh, one who asked the question. I hope that answered it for you. Um, I have another one here. It uh, says uh, cancer treatments are very expensive. I'm concerned that uh, I'd, I'd go broke if I needed to take them. Um, how realistic is it uh, that if I needed them, I could afford them? Uh, so uh, what, 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 uh, I know that some, some pharmaceutical companies uh, offer assistance. Uh, at least that's what my understanding. Uh, what's in place to help a, a patient who needs uh, these type of therapies uh, financially? Um, I, I can start off, but I'm sure Peter knows, knows a little more about this. Um, you know, I, I think it really depends so much on somebody's insurance plan, of course, yeah. which most of us as providers don't have a good sense of. So at least at the Roswell, we do have you know a group of financial advisors who can kind of walk you through what your copay is likely to be. And uh, so I always tell people to do that proactively. The other thing to remember is there's never an emergency to start a pill in the majority of folks. And it's much more important to sort the finances out uh, and, and then kind of take the next steps. But, but frankly, I, I think that's a huge issue, financial toxicity. And I don't think as a country, we have a good solution to that, at least as of now. Peter, I would agree. No, I would agree. I mean, I, I think that some of the new drugs, you know, like Xandy or, you know, they, you know, several thousand dollars a month. Even even uh, some copay, even if it's covered, it's co co copays can be, you know, very difficult to cover by patients. But in most patients, either through the, the company or, or assistant programs, it's us usually we can get coverage that helps. Um, uh, for for most patients, we can help bridge that gap with the current assistant programs out there. So. I, I mean, the only thing I think where we come in is, at least we try our best to do, is to try to mitigate the anxiety. Yeah. That, you know, if we started a month later, it's not the end of the world. Uh, right. And kind of making sure all the ducks are in a row and not missing out an opportunity to get something covered. Yeah, because I, you know, I know that, uh, you know, cases of uh, folks who are diagnosed with cancer, um, especially when it gets to a point where it's advanced stage, uh, the concern is always, uh, finance, am I uh, going to be able to afford to be sick? Um, uh, cost is huge. So um, at least I'm glad to hear that there's something in place to uh, to address. Uh, this so, so, so the other thing I have noticed, which I should bring up, is very often patients don't mention that to us, or, you know, and it'll come out three months later. Remember when you prescribed this? My copay was this, this, this. So I always tell them, please let us know. It's simply we simply are not aware, and at least if we are aware, we can you know try to do something about it. I mean, maybe not eliminate it. But very often, I, you know, it's always never, you know, I'm always amazed how you'd only find out four or five months later. So at least I try to remember to tell patients. And that's where I think our cancer care coordinators have been a huge asset. You know, they're able to approach these things proactively and, and you know, at least see where, you know, we can deliver help in a timely manner. So I guess, you know, the, uh, you know most, what's most important for those who are listening to this program is to make sure that you talk to your doctor and you're as uh, open about everything um, that may concern uh, your not only your health, uh, you know, issues, uh, things that uh, you may think are nothing, but your provider needs to hear about it. Uh, as far as well as your uh, financial uh, right. situation as well, very important to talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Because um, I know we are we are just about out of time. Um, I'm just going to throw out a real quick one. Uh, this is something that seems to be uh, consistent uh, as far as diet and exercise. Um, going back to the very beginning, diet and exercise is always important. Uh, especially when you are uh, at a place where you're metastatic, because um, I know that uh, you know oftentimes the treatments that you uh, you um, prescribe sometimes affect your uh, your diet, your ability to be want to want to eat. Um, what do you have to say? Uh, speak on that. Um, I mean, I mean, I, I think diet, diet, and exercise both I think are critically important, and I, I think prostate cancer has actually lagged behind a little bit the breast cancer. Research and what we know with diet, you know, high fat diets and high, you know, um, 
uh, those types of diets can affect kind of the hormonal milieu in the body and, and be negatively impact on the cancer and that um, um, diet, good diet, good exercise, which helps your immune system may actually at least delay or prevent recurrence in, in some settings. And so, so clearly, clearly it's an important component. Okay. And Richard, we do, have a clinic, we do have a clinical trial open here right now, uh, looking at diet and exercise intervention, which is actually run by my colleague in the basic sciences, Dr. Nastic, uh, specifically trying to understand this area okay. in, in men who are on hormone therapy. Okay, I thank you very much for that. We're, we're out of time and are going to have to leave you both. Uh, doctors, uh, thank you very much. Um, invaluable information. Um, we'll see you later on. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Peter. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. I'd uh, like to, as we segue into um, um, our next segment, I'd like to thank uh, Sanofi uh, Genzyme as we uh, introduce uh, Dr. Ali. Uh, he is the academic clinical associate in the uh, urology department at uh, Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Today, he's going to be speaking on incontinence and erectile dysfunction. Dr. Ali. Welcome. Hi, Richard. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here. Uh, so I'm going to give an overview today about how to deal with urinary and sexual problems after uh, prostate cancer treatment. Okay. Uh, let me share my slides. Yeah, that's right. We have backup if you can't get them. All right. So. First, how prostate cancer treatment can affect urinary function. So the surgical trauma after surgery to the sphincters, to the external and internal sphincters and the bladder neck, all of these can kind of contribute to urinary leakage after, um, after radical prostatectomy. And that's why we recommend Kegels exercises for all patients to kind of help in um, uh, as, as some sort of rehab, to provide some sort of rehabilitation for these uh, muscles and help recovery of uh, urinary function, bladder neck contracture, so scar tissue that can occur after surgery, and it can also occur after radiation in the area of the bladder neck or the urethra can also um, cause problems with urination. Radiation cystitis, so this is basically inflammation induced by radiation, uh, can also sometimes lead to irritation of the bladder and some irritate avoiding symptoms. Um, patients with prostate cancer on active surveillance or those treated with radiation can have associated bladder outlet obstruction from benign enlargement of the prostate, which can also contribute to um, problems with urination. So what are the symptoms? We have irritative voiding symptoms like increased frequency of urination, urgency, waking, waking up at night multiple times to urinate, obstructive symptoms, especially in patients with scarring or bladder outlet obstruction, and these include weak flow, straining to urinate, sense of incomplete emptying after uh, urination, or incontinence or urine leakage. This can be associated with urge, stress, which basically means that um, when patients kind of laugh or sneeze or do any sort of activity can leak urine. It could be a mix of both or overflow in patients with severe uh, outflow obstruction. Evaluation, uh, this is basically depends on patient reported symptoms using validated surveys. The most popular one is the International Prostate Symptom Score or the IPSS. Also the number of pads is important, especially in patients who underwent prostatectomy. And it's kind of one way to um, help objective evaluation and see whether there is any sort of improvement after surgery or not. Urine testing, uh, this includes urine analysis and culture. Basically, the presence of infection can further compound and worsen symptoms. So it's important to exclude the presence of urinary tract infection. Cystoscopy, so um, it's, it's kind of important to also evaluate whether there is any narrowing or any anatomical abnormality that can be contributing to symptoms. Um, so cystoscopy is an integral part of our evaluation as well. Urine dynamics. Uh, so this is a test where we test the nerve and muscle function of the bladder. Uh, and that's in particular important prior to uh, if the plan is to do some sort of surgical correction to, uh, to urine leak. There are also other studies that could be needed depending on the clinical situation. So how do we manage urinary issues? So there is some general advice that we give to all patients. 
and they are as important as the specific measure, measures. And this basically include the control of any associated comorbidities like diabetes, high blood pressure, weight loss would definitely uh, also help. Uh, avoidance of bladder irritants, moderation in alcohol and caffeine. Uh, there's some lifestyle advice that we give to patients, uh, especially those who wake up at night frequently, you know, some like um, limiting fluid intake a couple of hours prior to sleep, um, making sure that patients empty their bladders completely before they go to sleep as well. This can, can kind of help um, decrease the frequency of uh, wake, the number of time they wake up at night to uh, urinate. Pelvic floor muscle training, again, it's very, very important and it kind of um, rehabilitates the pelvic floor muscles and uh, helps early, earlier recovery of continence after, um, after surgery. So medications and surgery, this is basically depends on the cause of the um, urinary symptoms. So if the cause is uh, enlargement of the prostate in patients on active surveillance or patients who underwent radiation, so we have the alpha blockers that kind of relax the smooth, the smooth muscles of the prostate. And uh, these kind of tend to work um, um, like real quick, you know, I'd say probably in a few days, three to seven days. We have the, uh, the other class of medication, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and these shrink the prostate, but that's over the course of uh, a few months, like say three to six months. If patients have uh, uh, irritative bladder symptoms, what we call overactive bladder symptoms, then we have the anticholinergics, the relatively newer beta-3 agonists, and patients who are refractory for both, we can actually, there are actually more uh, uh, lines of treatment. Surgical treatment, again, for enlargement of the prostate, we have the classic TRP where we kind of with a scope, we scrape the uh, inside of the prostate. Um, it's a modification of it is the bipolar vaporization where we kind of just burn the, 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 press, the prostate tissue and vaporize it. And then we have the Eurolift. And as you can see here, this basically involves, you know, placing of uh, stainless steel clips that kind of pull the, pull the prostate and then open uh, a channel, as you can see here. Um, if we have narrowing of the uh, urethra, then uh, endoscopic management can be done. Um, either we cut it, we call it the DVIU, or we dilate the, uh, the narrowing. Some patients may require surgical treatment, though. For patients suffering from urinary leakage, we can, impl we can, do a, we can implant an artificial urinary sphincter that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. There are other also uh, things that uh, could be also uh, used depending on the clinical situation. So that's the artificial sphincter. As you can see here, it has three parts. So, uh, so this is the bladder here, and then that's the urethra. So the first part is the cuff, and it's enlarged here. The cuff, it's, it's kind of, it surrounds the urethra and it's filled with fluid. This fluid makes the cuff expanded and then it compresses the urethra, blocking it, making sure that the patient does not leak. The second part is the pump here, and we place it just next to the testicles in the scrotum. So when the patient wants to urinate, basically what he does, you just squeeze the pump and this will shift the fluid from the cuff here to the pressure balloon. The pressure balloon, that's the third part and we put it just next to the bladder. Um, basically what this would cause, you know, the, the, the cuff will decompress, the urethra will open, the patient will be able to urinate. And then after a minute or so, uh, automatically the pressure balloon will just pump the fluid back to the cuff and um, the cuff is again filled with fluid compressing the urethra and preventing urinary leakage. Uh, this device is implanted through two small incisions, one in the perineum and the other one is, is in the belly. Patients just stay overnight in the hospital. It's very easy to use and satisfaction rates are very high. So shifting to the second topic, which is how prostate cancer can affect sexual function. So first, nerve damage. And nerve damage can occur after radical prostatectomy. So if we are planning a non-nerve sparing surgery, and this happens when the cancer, there is kind of um, a, a more aggressive cancer and it's close to the nerves there. We, and unfortunately, we have to go wide and make sure we're not leaving any cancer behind. Or even with a nerve sparing surgery, uh, neuropraxia or what we call nerve concussion can occur and which can also lead to loss of function. Also radiation can damage uh, the nerves over uh, the course of, of years. Um, metabolic syndrome. So um, that's actually also very important. And that's the main cause of erectile dysfunction in non-cancer patients. Um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol level, 
uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled heart conditions, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and lack of exercise, all of these can kind of uh, affect the, 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 the blood vessels going to the penis and therefore can affect erections. Um, psychologic, uh, and that's kind of also a well-defined entity and a well-defined cause for erectile dysfunction. Uh, and that's why the, the, the um, involvement of partners is very, very important in, uh, in treatment of erectile dysfunction. There are also some medications, some drugs that can affect erections. Um, for example, hormonal therapy for uh, advanced prostate cancer, basically it suppresses testosterone level, which would affect the sex drive and also erections as well. Evaluation, again, patient reported using validated surveys most commonly the IIEF or its short form, the SHIM, careful history, history taking to identify what the problem is. Uh, sometimes patients are not kind of able to differentiate between problems with erection or ejaculation or orgasm. These are kind of three distinct processes, but they just occur uh, uh, next to each other. And then we have, uh, of course, involving the partner, that's also very important. Uh, some labs may be needed, uh, depending on the clinical situation, the lipid profile, hormonal profile, including testosterone level and others as clinically indicated. So management, again, general or lifestyle measures. These are very, very important. Exercise, weight loss, smoking cessation, control of comorbidities. All of these are very, very important. Then we have the medication, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. That's kind of the first line of treatment. Um, and these are kind of, these include sildenafil, tadalafil, or they're uh, maybe more known uh, uh, um, uh, like brands like Viagra and Cialis. And the, the, key, the key here is patient education because not all of these agents are the same. Some are, you know, absorption may be affected um, by meals like Viagra, for example, it's, or sildenafil, uh, which should be taken on an empty stomach, which is basically four hours after, uh, after a meal. Uh, and then how much, how, how, how much time they need to reach um, a desirable level uh, in, in the blood, and then how long they remain in the blood. And of course, the importance of sexual stimulation. These medications by themselves do not induce erections, but basically all what they do, they kind of augment the normal process. So sexual stimulation is also very important. And one of the main reasons these medications don't work is basically that the patient, they just don't, do not take it the right way. So that's again, a, a, a very important you know, patient education. Um, Replacing testosterone in patients with testosterone level, that's kind of remains a little bit controversial. Um, there is growing evidence to support, you know, the safety of um, giving testosterone in patients with low-grade prostate cancer who are on active surveillance and have low testosterone, symptomatic low testosterone levels. Uh, but still, this is kind of an area of debate, and uh, this should be a, a decision between, a discussion between the patient and the, uh, uh, the urologist. Other lines include the intraurethral suppository, um, uh, something like Muse. Basically, it's a small pellet that the patients uh, use an applicator to introduce into their urethra. And uh, this, is, this is very effective. It can lead to some urethral irritation, like say minor bleeding, maybe, maybe infection. Um, and these are all related to the method of administration. Um, there is the penile injections, where patients directly inject um, uh, drugs into the penis. And again, this is also very effective, but the problem with it may be the, um, you know, some patients do not really like the use of needles. Um, it can, again, cause some minor bleeding or scarring at the site of the induction. An important complication is priapism, which is prolonged painful erection that can also occur. And that's why for both the, the suppository and the injections, it's, it's always recommended to have the first injection in the office uh, under supervision just to make sure patients are doing it in the right way and also to kind of make sure that the the uh, uh, the dose they're taking is safe. Vacuum device, again, it's a cylinder placed around the penis that creates a vacuum and draws blood passively into the penis, creating an erection. A constriction ring can be applied to maintain the erection. Uh, this is this is kind of, it's, it's more, um, we've noticed that older patients who do not really engage in sexual intercourse very frequently kind of prefer, um, prefer that. It, it can cause some, uh, some numbness and some bruising, but generally it's, it's kind of, it's, it's safe. Penile implants, that's kind of the uh, most invasive. However, it has the highest rates of satisfaction. And we have three, um, three types of penile implants. 
So first we have the semi-rigid or the non-inflatable. And basically what it includes, we kind of replace the normal erectile tissue, as you can see here, with cylinders that we place in the penis. So when the patient is interested in intercourse, he would just position the penis up like that. And then after sexual activity, he would just put it down. Very effective. Uh, it's done through a very small incision, very simple to place. The only problem was that it's less concealed. You know, the, the, the cylinders are rigid all the time. This takes us to the second type, which is the two-piece penile prothesis. And as you can see here, in addition to the two cylinders, we have a pump here placed in the scrotum. When patient uh, desires an erection, he will squeeze the pump, the fluid would shift and go to fill the cylinders, causing, a, uh, 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 causing erection. And then after the patient uh, is done with intercourse, he will just bend the penis like that. And this would shift the fluid back as you can see here. And third, the three piece, which basically in addition to, as you can see here, in addition to the cylinders and the pump. So the pump has an extra piece above it called, it's, it's like a button. And then there is a reservoir that we place very close to the bladder. Basically when the patient desires an erection, what he would do, he would just squeeze the pump, as you can see here, and this shifts the fluid from the from the uh, reservoir to the cylinder, uh, uh, causing an erection. And then, when the patient is done, you just press the button, and this would shift the fluid back from the cylinders um, to the reservoir. So that's basically, you know, an overview of um, how to deal with the urinary and sexual problems after. Um, treatment for prostate cancer. Uh, thank you for listening and back to you, Richard. Hey, Dr. Ali, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, questions are uh, streaming in right now. Uh, so we'll get to you uh, when we get to that part of the, uh, the program. Uh, as we move forward, I uh, want to thank the University of Rochester Wilmot Center um, and introduce uh, Dr. Fong. Uh, Dr. Fong is the Associate Professor of the Department of Medicine, uh, Hematology, Oncology at the Wilmot uh, Cancer Institute, University of Rochester Medical Center. So we're speaking on the consequences of ADT. Uh, Dr. Fung, welcome. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me here today. And um, I'm excited to share um, my talk with everyone. So today we're going to talk about consequences of androgen deprivation therapy. So before I begin to talk about what androgen deprivation therapy is, I, I just want to divide this class of medicine into two classes. So what androgen deprivation therapy is, we actually use these agents to, de to decrease the testosterone level to castrated level. What that means is less than 50. That's the usual um, definition. And, and that is usually before historically achieved by surgery to remove the testis. But with these classes of medicine, now we are able to, um, um, to do the same with medicine and potentially it can be reversed. So the first class of, yes. Oh, you don't. Let me see. Let me see. Do you see it now? Yep. We're okay, good. perfect. So sorry. So the two androgen deprivation, I mean, two classes of androgen deprivation therapy include what GNRH stands for is gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist. What this class of medicine does is to stimulate the pituitary gland in the brain to, produ to produce two hormones, the luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. Paradoxically, when you have chronic treatment with this class of medicine, it would at some point downregulate the gonadotropin receptor and cause the fall of um, luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone leading to decreased um, testosterone level. This class of androgen deprivation therapy consists of Lupolite, Elagar, or Lupron, Zoladax, or Trilstar. And with, when we use this class of medicine, what we can see is that because at the beginning, it stimulates the pituitary gland. So actually, a lot of times during the first few weeks, you can see a paradoxical rise in testosterone before it can come back down. So what I tell my patients usually is, we usually start them on a pill called casodex or bicalutamide to block all the androgen receptor in case there's a flaring of this testosterone before they get the first injection. I usually do that um, for four weeks. 
um, actually give the shot within one to two weeks um, before we start this class of medicine. The other class of androgen deprivation therapy um, that we have is gonadotropin releasing antagonist. So instead of the stimulation actually blocks it. So what that does is um, that, that there's actually one injection that's a monthly injection um, that's called Fremagon. Um, I don't personally use this a lot because of the monthly injection, but actually um, recently um, at the last ASCO meeting, um, it shows a new oral agent, not yet FDA approved. I don't know when FDA approval would be, and I would talk a little bit about that agent. Um, it's actually called Relugolex, um, which is a GnRH antagonist, which, which has a lot of interest right now. So, so next slide, show you the side effects of androgen deprivation therapy. As many of the patients here might know, you may experience hot flashes, loss of libido, decreased sexual performance, decreased muscle mass, all because of low testosterone level. It can also accelerate osteoporosis and bone density loss. And that's a critical point because a lot of times, you know, patient, um, can easily break their bone if they have accelerated osteopenia, osteoporosis, especially for patients who have cancer already metastasized to the bone. Fatigue, there's some concern about decreased cognitive function for long-term use, definitely weight gain, altered lipid profile that might lead to increased cardiovascular risk. So there are some, you know, management of hot flashes. Unfortunately, we don't have a home run medicine or home run intervention to really manage the hot flashes. Two medicines that I think about that I discuss with my patient are venefaxin um, or Effexor, which is a, um, a, 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 a site antidepressant agent. And the other one is gabapentin or neurontin that I commonly discuss with my patients. Um, I also talk about non-pharmacologic interventions such as regular exercise. I think it's very important. Um, as people exercise more, I think they feel better even with the fatigue level, a healthy diet. And also we, we have you know, integrative oncology supportive care. I think at most major cancer center that I sometimes refer my patients to talk about exercise diet. They also offer you know, acupuncture massage that might be helpful for some patients. Management of sexual dysfunction, you know, there, there are many ways to manage it. And I also work closely with our colleagues in urology, such as any type of erectogenic AIDS. Um, Viagra and Cialis may work, but I think it's also hard because of the low testosterone level and you have very low libido. Any type of devices, such as vacuum erection devices, any type of injection therapy, penile implants that some patients find helpful. I also encourage our patients to, you know, engage in some type of sexual counseling, instruction in some type of alternative sexual practices. And I think most important is actually engage your partner to be part of this discussion, because this is something that I think would um, not just affect the patient him, himself, but actually his partner. So I think engaging your partner, talking about this openly and honestly is always helpful. So this is the new agent that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, which is the GnRNH oral antagonist. Um, so what this study did was that it actually is a phase three clinical trial. Phase three clinical trial means it's the latest phase. They compared the standard of care, which is the, in this case, Luprolide, which is Lupron on Elegard with this new oral agent. And, the, and they used both of these um, interventions or medications for 48 weeks, so close to one year. The result has been published in New England Journal of Medicine. And the primary endpoint they looked at is actually sustained castration rate. What that means is how many of these patients by using these two interventions have sustained low level of testosterone less than 50. And what they found was that the orange graph here, if you can see my arrow, shows the new oral agent. It has sustained castration rates of 96.7% compared to Luprolide, which is 88.8%. And then subsequently, they look at the testosterone level. How long does it take for your testosterone level to go down? 
So in the graph B here, it shows you the orange graph, I mean, orange line, which is the new oral agent. It shows that your testosterone by starting this oral medicine, actually within one week, it goes down to close to castrate level. As you can see, as I mentioned, because Luprolite is a GnRH antagonist, it takes some time. And there's this rise in testosterone during the first week or two before it comes down. What's interesting is that for people who are on this oral agent, when they are in one week 49, which is one week after they stop the medicine, you can see the testosterone go up much faster when they stop the oral agent compared to the lupolite treatment. Uh, it takes close to 90 days and still not back up to a hundred, I mean, back to a hundred. So and these are very interesting data. And what's interesting to to many of us is the major adverse cardiovascular events, as you can see in this graph. How they define major adverse cardiovascular event include major non-fatal heart attack, non-fatal stroke or death from any cause. What they found was that the cumulative incidence of major adverse cardiovascular risk is definitely lower with this agent, it's 2.8% compared to 4.6%. I mean, it's a difference around two to three percent clinically, um, but it's something of interest as we think about long-term consequences of um, of these agents. Um, so that's something that we should keep an eye out and see um, how this is going to fare with the FDA. And our my speculation is that it would be one of the other class of treatment we can think about for androgen deprivation therapy. So for surveillance of bone mineral density, I usually get a baseline DEXA scan to look at the bone mineral density to make sure that um, our patients don't have osteopenia that might require, you know, um, supplementation to make sure that um, with calcium, vitamin D or use of an agent called prolia to prevent bone loss. And then also subsequently, I follow their bone mineral density every two years. So how do we manage the bone mineral density? We, I really encourage all our patients to do weight-bearing exercises that can help prevent bone loss. We recommend calcium and vitamin D for a lot of our patients. For selected patients with osteopenia or osteoporosis, we definitely talk about bisphosphonate. Or the other one actually was studied for prostate cancer patient um, called denosumab, which is an anti-rank ligand antibody. We can use something called denosumab prolia if they have what we call the T-score of less than 1.0, showing that they're at risk of bone mineral density loss and osteopenia. We recommend that every six months as they undergo androgen deprivation therapy. So this is the study that actually looked at um, the benefit of um, the um, 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 denosumab, which is, we also use to manage you know, people with metastatic prostate cancer that have bone metastases because they are at risk of pathologic fractures. What this graph show is that they actually compare, this study was like close to 10 years ago now, compare what we call Exgeva, which is a money, monthly injection to a Zomata, which is every three week infusion. And it shows a um, benefit here showing in the graph that it delays any event of um, skeletal event like fractures or bone pain um, by, by, by around three months. So both of them are options, but um, we tend to use the nosomat because of this study. As we start these medicine, we also have to be mindful of you know, the side effects. Um, so there's this uh, dreaded you know, side effect called osteonecrosis of the jaw, um, which is around one to 2% of cases. And actually, um, we always ask our patients to discuss this medicine with their dentist to make sure that you know, um, they, they don't have any risk factor for predisposing them to osteoporosis of, um, of the jaw. Um, so we always ask them to not perform any elective surgical um, procedure when they're on this medication. And then if any dental alveolar surgery is performed, they should be subsequently evaluated by the dental specialist on a frequently scheduled basis. Um, it's unclear how, how long you, you should um, hold it or restart it after dental surgery. Uh, but I, I actually, I would have a discussion with the dentist and talk to the patient about some of those risks. 
So this this is a very brief overview of the you know side effects and some newer novel agent for androgen deprivation therapy. And I'm happy to take any questions from anyone. I really thank you everyone for their time today and inviting me. Mm -hmm. You're uh, you're very welcome, uh, Dr. Fong. Uh, I want to thank you both uh, for being here today. Uh, this uh, has been uh, an just invaluable, the information that's uh, come out of today's uh, uh, program. Uh, I do have questions. Um, and uh, Dr. Fung, since uh, you, uh, you you finished up last, I'll leave with you first. Uh, it is, uh, does PSA doubling time decrease every time you stop ADT uh, Allegard? Say that again? I'm sorry, I missed a lot. Uh, does, uh, does PSA doubling time decrease every time you stop ADT Allegard? Yeah, so... I think the when we stop the um, the androgen depri I mean the 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 treatment with androgen deprivation therapy definitely the PSA likely will increase and also I want to know are we are we talking about metastatic disease localized disease I I mean because definitely the PSA will go up if the disease is metastatic when you stop it and I guess your question is does it does the PSA PSA doubling time increase more every single time you restart the medicine. Exactly. So I think if we are talking about, you know, someone with either biochemical recurrent disease or some cancer that is becoming resistant to the androgen deprivation therapy, there's definitely a chance that the PSA doubling time may increase. So I usually for metastatic disease, we don't usually stop the androgen deprivation therapy because that's the backbone, all right? But for patient, what we call biochemical recurrent prostate cancer, what, which means is that they have surgery for the prostate, they have radiation for the prostate cancer, but then the PSA start going up. But on CAT scan and bone scan, we don't see any radiographic evidence that the disease is coming back. In those scenarios, we can do intermittent hormone therapy. So definitely if you do it for a duration of time for eight to nine months, when you stop it, every single time you stop it, you know, there's a chance that it might come back faster. I think that's what we are getting at. So that's definitely is something that we monitor. That's why we monitor the PSA every two to three months in those cases. When it start doubling really fast, I usually use nine to 12 months, less than nine to 12 months, we might have to restart another course of the hormone therapy because we just don't want the patients to have prostate cancer that would grow so fast that it would start affecting the bone, affecting the lymph node, and causing pain. That's what we are hoping to avoid. Did I answer your question, Richard? Yeah, no, that was, yeah, that was a question from the uh, from uh, the folks who are observing this program. Perfect. Perfect. But, but actually, I was going to ask, uh, I was going to ask, I, I, and I hope that uh, whoever asked this question that uh, your question was answered, because I was going to ask you, uh, how long did you have to remain on ADP, uh, ADT? And uh, you answered that question as well. Yes, yes. So I think for metastatic disease, that's the backbone. Definitely some patients may not tolerate it. And they have done study looking at intermittent versus continuous therapy for people with metastatic disease. They cannot say that by using intermittent therapy is not inferior to, you know, continuous, but definitely we, we tailor it to the patient. If patients are having a difficult time, we can hold it, you know, but it just, we just share the facts with the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, yeah. uh, Dr. Ali. Um, uh, do you recommend or have you recommended men for a, a psychiatric or emotional therapy treatment coupled with uh, uh, technical uh, surgery, medical uh, treatment for ED issues uh, that have developed after prostatectomies? So uh, essentially, have there, has there been any other follow-up, um, emotional follow-up? For these patients, yeah, that's, kinda, a, that's that's psychological assessment in managing any any kind of psychological issues is very very important because even in non-cancer patients, um, just psych psychological issues by themselves can cause erectile dysfunction. So that's kind of very important, and it's it's an integral part. Psychological evaluation is an integral part of our evaluation for sure. Okay, so yeah, the question was, uh, what uh, what do you have in place for that? Uh, is that something you yourself do? You bring in extra help for that? No, we do. Yeah, we 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 kind of refer patients to um, uh, uh, to somebody who can help with that, like uh, somebody who's expert in psychology or psychiatry, for sure. Okay, thank. You. I have another one for you as well. Um, patients that have gone through uh, penile procedures. Uh, do they have to come in for routine tune-ups uh, once a, a device is implanted? 
Um, how often do they have to come in? It kind of, so first, uh, after the patients get the, uh, the penile implant, it remains uh, inactive for six weeks. And then we bring the patients, make sure that they are capable of using it. And then we can do, um, uh, I prefer to see patients uh, earlier first, I'd say probably at three or six months. And then if patients are doing okay, I'll just see them every year afterwards. Okay. I think that was a pretty good answer for that. Uh, uh, so you're following them. And that's what people want to know to make sure there are any yes, problems. Yes, sure. because some because um, um, as any device, you know, these the mechanical dysfunction can just happen. Yes, you know, uh, and this can happen sooner or later. Um, um, I, I haven't seen any so far, but you know, this is kind of reported in the literature that mechanical dysfunction can happen. Also, there are other complications, you know, like um, uh, like erosion. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, in, in, in some situations, we see that you know the body is kind of uh, starts to react against the device. So it's it's very important to keep an eye on uh, to continue to follow the patients for sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, this one's for you, Dr. Fung. Um, uh, do you find that uh, the uh, you find that there's an occurrence of uh, uh, osteonecrosis is reflective uh, of your own clinical experience? Uh, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, so osteoporosis definitely because a lot of our um, prostate cancer patients, I mean, prostate cancer usually affect the older group of patients. So, and osteoporosis are actually also happen in, in elderly patients. So definitely when we do a baseline DEXA scan, what we hope to do is to screen for any weakening of the bone, such as osteopenia, which is not as severe as osteoporosis. And what we look at on the report is the T-score. So for all the patients, we look at what we call the T-score. Negative 1.0 to negative 1, I mean 2.5 means you have osteopenia. So that's the less severe form of weakening of the bone. When it's less than negative 2.5, that's called osteoporosis. So it can be quite common. And for people who do not have bone metastases, but require um, um, androgen deprivation therapy for treatment of the prostate cancer, definitely I encourage them to talk to their urologist, talk to their oncologist about you know, the denosinant because that has been shown in prostate cancer patients to actually prevent bone density loss, and in some cases, actually increase the bone density loss. As I mentioned, in addition to that, they should also you know, think about calcium vitamin D um, and also weight-bearing exercise, walking, you know, any type of you know, exercise that can help um, build up bone density is helpful. But yes, osteoporosis is, is, is common. Um, and what we don't want is, especially for people who already have bone metastases from the prostate cancer, if you have underlying osteoporosis or osteopenia and you have cancer in the bone, that can weaken it already. What we don't want is any type of fractures because that can be very devastating. So definitely talk to your physicians, you know, where you're getting treated about these type of treatment, um, the denosinant, as I mentioned. So I think those are very um, important. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ali, um, is uh, penis size affected, uh, made smaller uh, by any of the procedures uh, that you mentioned? That's a very good question. Uh, so radical prostatectomy itself, because when we, when we kind of, uh, when we remove the prostate, we have to control the blood supply that's going to the prostate. We have also to control some of the blood vessels that kind of that go to the penis as well, and the the the, the radical prostatectomy itself can result in a decrease in penile length. And the answer the to the question whether penile implants can do that as well or not, yes, in in some cases they can uh, affect the penile length, but not to a great extent, not to not to kind of something that would make, you know, uh, intercourse, uh, that would affect, you know, intercourse or would affect uh, uh, satisfaction. But yeah, they could result in, 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 uh, in some decrease in penile length. Okay, yeah, well, I guess the uh, understanding is about the, uh, the, uh, the implant uh, in the existing penis, uh, realizing that uh, the, some of the uh, urethra has to be uh, a trip, uh, snipped, trimmed, is that correct? No, so the um, because so, of the removal of the prostate, no. I'm sorry. Because of the removal of the prostate, uh, does that take any of the length away from the urethra? And does the device itself uh, can it use the existing uh, penis tissue to extend? No. So removing the prostatic urethra does not 
by like because we remove the so the um, um, I guess the question is uh, the removing the prostate with the prosthetic urethra would result in shrinkage of the penis or decrease in the size of the penis. So no, no. So it's it basically the penile the the penis has the um, the penile urethra, which is kind of not not really affected, but the 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 blood supply to the penis itself can be uh, can be affected by surgery. But again, all of these kind of, they do not really result in significant shrinkage and, you know, placing the implant in would actually help, you know, uh, what's more important for a successful uh, intercourse is the rigidity rather than just the length. Of course, yes. Um, uh, there was something else you had mentioned about um, uh, vaporized uh, stainless steel clips entering the urethra. Uh, please help me understand how pain short and long term are managed. Uh, I guess you're speaking about the uh, uh, TERP when you uh, talked about the TERP. Um, I think they're referring probably to the urethra, the, 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 the newer procedure. So yeah, so uh, any any procedure, um, transurethral or any endoscopic procedure through the penis, through the urethra would result in some short-term irritation. This kind of varies depending on the amount of tissue that we remove, the, uh, the, the, the technology used, um, and that's why in some patients, uh, I personally prefer to leave the catheter in after such procedures for a few days. Uh, um, some surgeons would just prefer to take it out immediately. I find that the, the, you know, the irritation from the procedure, the swelling of, of the tissues itself uh, as a result of the procedure can, can result in significant urinary irritation. Um, so that's why we, you know, I, I personally prefer to keep the catheter in for uh, at least for a few days. And then it's not unusual to have some discomfort for the first few weeks after the procedure, but these tend to go away afterwards. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope that answered uh, your question. Um, Dr. Fung, uh, when, uh, how, um, uh, who, how, and when was ADT uh, discovered and the first treatments implemented and how have they been refined since? And I realize that might be a very long uh, answer to that question, uh, but that's, um, so how, uh, how, who, uh, who, how, and when was ADT discovered and the first treatments implemented and have they been refined since then? So, you know, as you are asking me that question, I'm learning some historical facts about antigen deprivation okay. therapy. So it's and right I, on time. Okay. I don't know the answer, but I am, I think Google has been very helpful. So what I found was I just pulled something up. Um, Richard, I'm happy to give you more accurate um, historical facts. It seems like it's, Around 1941, that's what I'm looking at, is by two scientists that found that, you know, um, prostate cancer might benefit from testosterone um, suppression. So at the beginning, um, I'm looking at this right now, they used bilateral surgical orchiectomy. But at some point, it was, I, I, I don't know the exact year. I don't know. Ali, do you know? <laughs> Um, I think they kind of, they got also the Nobel Prize for that. I yeah, but I forgot the exact yeah. year, so I don't want to, I, Richard, can I get back to you on that? And do you, you get back to tell me. you? Yeah, I will get you back to you on that. But it's, yeah. uh, I, I will learn something new today together about history. I'm actually able to follow up here so I can follow up whatever. Yeah, I am going to look around right now and send it to chat so you can share that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And just, just, uh, just for clarity, it was, uh, it was actually necrosis, not, um, uh, that was the actual word it was used. I, I, it was a spelling as it came across here um, from necrosis uh, instead of uh, osteoporosis. Osteo, uh, it you mean from the jaw? Necrosis is what is the word I was looking for. Yeah, osteonecrosis of the jaw. Yes, yes. So yes, okay. it's osteo. So, so hold, yeah. It's okay. Gotcha. Yeah, now so I understand. Ast yeah, osteonecrosis of the jaw is a serious side effect from the denosoma, polio, exgiva. So, I mean, Unfortunately, it does happen to patients. So it just, you have to catch it early on and also um, making sure that you do everything to prevent it. And I usually work with the dentist, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, wow, um, a lot going on here. I know that we are getting short on time. So- um, I only, found uh, a number, it's 1980s. For, 1980? For the, oh, okay. 1980s, yeah. For the luteinizing hormone releasing, I mean, agonist. Yes, 1980s. Okay, uh, so whoever answered that, asked that question, there's your answer. Um, and I think I have um, one more. It has to do with the uh, the shot. I know it's um, uh, you had asked about having the, the penile shot in the office, 
and uh, to see if it works. So now I have something that's lasting longer than I, you know, what do I do with it after it happens in your office? Yeah, so we have, uh, that's a very good question. So this refers to the, the occurrence of priapism. So we have medications that we can give and can kind of, and mo in most of the cases it, it would just reverse it. And, uh, and also we give, we, give the, the, uh, we give patients a script for these medications. It's just a pill that they take and it could help in reversing, um, in reversing this. In more resistant cases, this has to kind of, you know, to be managed with, we, we just need to evacuate the blood in the penis. Uh, and this, this is, this is kind of, uh, in, in sometimes we even need to do more than that. You know, after we evacuate the blood, we need to inject some medications directly into the penis to kind of, to help it get down. But in the vast majority of cases, a pill can just take care of that. Okay. And I see we are out of time. I just, um, I know that uh, the last thing I had here was about using the penile injections and they're not very enticing. So they avoid contact and it was about uh, cost of the implant, which is a, a probably a longer or maybe even unknown um, answer for that. Um, but uh, whatever, uh, I, I'll talk to you offline. I can get whatever information I need and I'll follow up for those who ask questions. Uh, I wanna thank you both because we are out of time and we're about to move into our next section. So uh, Dr. Ali and Dr. Fong, thank you so very much. Thank you. Uh, thank I'll you. Talking to you very soon. All right, thank bye you so bye. much. Sorry, I've been doing this all day long and I forgot to unmute myself. I wanna thank uh, <laughs> uh, Avi uh, Allegan uh, for, um, their participation in this program as we move in. And I want to uh, introduce our next speaker who is um, uh, Caitlin uh, Chidester. She is a BSN, RN, oncology nurse, uh, coordinator at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, she'll be speaking today on uh, care coordination and the patient journey, as well as education. Um, Caitlin, welcome. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin. Um, I'm a nurse coordinator here at Roswell Park um, and I'll be talking to you today about care coordination, the patient journey and patient education. So nurse navigators are, um, it, through this presentation, nurse coordinator, nurse navigator are gonna mean the same thing. Roswell uses nurse coordinators, but a lot of other um, institutions use nurse navigators. So I'll use them inter interchangeably. Nurse navigators are, um, oh, let me share my, my screen here. One second. Okay. There we go. Okay. So um, what is a nurse or nurse coordinator? We are members of the multidisciplinary team. And our role is to help patients navigate through the healthcare system. We are registered nurses. Um, we often have backgrounds in specialty areas of oncology or critical care. So we have essential skill sets and clinical expertise so that we can best provide individualized um, assistance to patients and their families and their caregivers their entire um, cancer treatment journey. It often starts with um, diagnosis, treatment, um, survivorship, and particularly um, in my role as um, a metastatic prostate cancer coordinator, um, helping with end of life. So um, just a brief history about nurse navigation. Um, back in the 90s, uh, Dr. Harold Freeman um, worked in the Harlem Hospital community. And what they found was that um, there was increased cancer rates for an uninsured and underinsured um, patient population. So they started a patient navigation system. And what they found was that increased access to screening and helping to eliminate those barriers to healthcare um, greatly improved the five-year cancer survival rates, which is really huge in oncology. Um, due to those successes, in 2005, President Bush signed into law the Patient Navigator and Chronic Disease Prevention Act, which was then amended by the Affordable Care Act, um, which required that centers develop and implement patient navigation services that helped improve outcomes for individuals with cancer and other chronic diseases, 
um, with emphasis on health disparate patient populations. Um, as these programs developed and um, were implemented and the data showed drastic improvements, um, in 2012, the surgeons actually mandated as a standard of care, the navigation programs were started. And in order for cancer centers to get approval, they had to implement these programs by 2015. Um, with regard to Park, we started piloting these programs in our GI clinic in 2016. And shortly thereafter, uh, the urology clinic um, got three oncology nurse coordinators. So um, what's nice about our urology clinic is that we specialize in specific disease sites. So my patient population is metastatic prostate, testicular, and adrenal. I have another colleague who solely deals with metastatic kidney and bladder. And my third colleague, um, her focus is just the surgical bladder patients who are getting cystectomies or neobladders, and those um, patients require a lot of coordination. Um, the benefit, because we focus on these specific disease sites, um, we're better able to meet the needs of our um, of our particular patient populations, sort of become, you know, mini experts um, for myself in, in prostate cancer. Um, so what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm just going to sort of get into on the next few slides, but everything we do and that um, we do as coordinators or navigators across the country, oh, I apologize. Um, Sorry, I have an idle screen. Um, sorry about that. Um, that um, they're always within the context of meeting the overarching goals of navigation. And um, those include assisting the patient with navigating the healthcare system, which can be incredibly challenging, um, especially for aging population, which is very common. Um, providing timely access to early screening, um, diagnosis and treatment in particular, once they're, they've come to Roswell, they've generally already been diagnosed, um, which, and because we're providing timely access to early, um, doing those things early, we can help reduce the incidence of cancer mortality. Um, reduce the incidence, uh, reduce cancer incidence and mortality. Um, once a patient has had cancer, they're at an increased risk for other cancers. So um, by helping to coordinate care and just keeping tabs on them along the way, we can help reduce that also. Uh, we help remove any barriers to care, which often includes developing sort of culturally education. This um, in particular, um, plays a key role in that. Really, um, at least for me as a, as a nurse coordinator and, and really in my over 20 years of nursing is really helping to improve a patient's quality of life, no matter where they are um, in their work. Many of you have sort of seen um, in the symposium is that prostate cancer um, is very different for, for lots of people. Um, so a lot of my job is helping to educate and support patients um, as they try to understand um, their diagnosis. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to switch that slide. The, these were the goals, the goals of navigation. I apologize for that. Um, how, how do we do that? So um, the nice thing about nurse navigators or coordinators are often the first contact person that a patient has once referred to an oncology center. Um, here at Roswell, once you call wanting to be a new patient, um, I get that list and I, I make um, a, a phone call to the new patient before they even come. I introduce myself, um, I sort of tell them what to expect to visit. I answer any questions they may have. Um, where do they park? Um, what do they do once they arrive? Um, for some phone calls, it's just a couple minutes. Um, it's 15, 20 minutes if patients have a lot of anxiety or questions. Um, but thereafter, during the initial visits and ongoing, um, I, I sort of like to tell my patients that I'm their go-to girl. Um, and when I say patients, I mean families. It's really important that the patients go through this um, to the extent that they have family with them. It, it 
you know, that everybody's kind of on the same page to provide the best outcomes and quality of life. So, um, but during those visits and, and ongoing, I get to know the patients, their, you know, who their support systems are. Do they have kids? Do they have grandkids? What do they do for a living? Um, what are their interests? Do they like to golf? Um, do they like to travel? Um, I help explain prostate cancer and the different treatment um, it's very common to have a have a new um, prostate cancer patient with metastatic disease come in and say, oh my gosh, you know, my dad had had prostate cancer for 30 years and he was fine. Or, you know, my brother had his prostate out 10 years ago and he's fine. Like, why, why do I have metastatic disease in my bones? Um, and a lot of that is done education that's ongoing, you know, the, the more information you have from, from the right resources gives you a more power and control over your feelings and your outcomes. Um, I, I tell people that, um, you, you know, everything that I tell them is in the paperwork, I give them a bag of information with books and that they don't have to, you know, remember anything, everything is there and they can always ask questions, leave. Uh, we talk about their expectations throughout treatment, um, I help them make informed decisions, um, help discuss what their, their life are going to do before their cancer diagnosis. How can we help them fulfill those goals in alternative ways during treatment? Um, what are their goals in the future to help them prepare for life during and after treatment? Um, do they have a bucket list? You know, kind of the things that in the context of whatever their diagnosis is, in, in getting to know them on a personal level is really kind of helping to coordinate their care along their treatment journey. So what do you do um, on a daily basis along with my colleagues? Um, really kind of everything that you can imagine. You know, my, my goal is really just to help make it easier for patients and their families, make it less stressful, you know, getting a new cancer diagnosis or, um, finding out that, you know, you thought you were cured of cancer because you had a prostatectomy 10 years ago, and now, now you're in my clinic with a, a right day in bone meth, and that can be really devastating. Um, so anything that I can do to just help make the day-to-day -day things better is, is really what I do. Um, on any given day, I can do all of these things. Um, sometimes I have a, a to-do list and everything gets done and other days I don't accomplish anything on my to-do list because I get emails and phone calls from patients that require me to do other things. How do I um, coordinate care with other clinics? We have a lot of patients that also get radiation. Um, either maybe they've had a prostatectomy and they have a say, so they need um, radiation in the hopes of cure or if they have metastatic disease, um, which is the, the favorite place like to go, it can cause pain. So a lot of patients need um, paleo to radiate the spine to help with their pain. Um, cancer patients, um, they, they have a lot of symptoms or comorbidities. Um, so we, I help refer them to the palliative care clinic where they can help manage symptoms um, to help, you know, get them as strong as possible. Uh, we help, I help patients um, help to ensure with the, with the team that we're providing culturally competent care. Somebody um, may deal with their prostate cancer diagnosis very differently if they, they come from a big, large Italian family where everybody shares everything versus if maybe you were a member of the, the, um, a different community, an Asian you know, community where you like to keep things very private. Um, I help make patients, I help patients and their families make treatment decisions by educating them, you know, dealing with the side effects of chemo. What should I make? Should I have chemo? Um, should I just stick with a pill? Um, you know, a lot of patients come in and they they say, nope, I'm never having chemo. I'm not going to do it. I saw my sister go through it. My mother go through it. Um, and what a lot of prostate cancer patients don't know is that, you know, those chemos are generally several chemos. They make patients feel very Prostate cancer chemo is not that it has side effects or that it doesn't, but it's just one drug. It's fairly well tolerated amongst men. And usually I can convince patients, you know, to do chemo and, and, and they do admit that it wasn't as bad as they thought it was. Um, I help schedule, you know, imaging studies, state, you know, when, when you have metastatic prostate cancer, we, we commonly restage you. That involves the bone scans and CT scans. 
live far away. I help get you outside scripts so that you can have those closer to home. Uh, it, once you have those scans, I help get the record next visit. Um, those. Um, I facilitate outside services um, for maybe a neurologic evaluation for somebody with dementia, or I deal with a you know testicular cancer, so I help those patients get fertility patient services. Uh, identifying where a patient can fall through the clack, cracks. You wouldn't believe how many patients don't have primary care physicians, and, uh, or maybe they're on you know blood pressure medicines, or maybe they have memory issues and can't remember to take their pills. So I get them community resources to help a uh, visiting to fill a pill box, helping to coordinate timely appointments, following up on appointments. You know, you come in and see the physician, and we say, oh, we're going to do all these things, and it job to sort of make sure that all those things get planned and, um, you know, scheduled. Uh, I, I call patients their first androgen deprivation therapy shot. Feeling uh, patients may think that they're fine, but then they tell me some symptoms and I think, I really think they can be evaluated. So we get them into our treatment center, which is kind of like an urgent care here at Roswell. I'm constantly pro providing support to families and patients, you know, diagnosis and grief in different ways. You know, when you have a metastatic prostate cancer diagnosis, that, that's, you're, you're going through this grief. You're, you're grieving for the life that you once thought you had and now needing to come to terms. You know, some are okay with it, but they're white. Their children are, you know, I do see, you know, men in their 40s with metastatic prostate cancer that have young children or children and they're worried about what's going to happen after they're gone. Um, resources, dietary, social work, pastoral care, PT, OT, you know, do they need a visiting nurse to come out to help change their neck tube dressing? Um, I'm helping them prepare for life after treatment, you know, after their chemo, helping them you know, healthy eating habits or exercising. Um, helping with, um, you know, do they need a wheelchair or transportation or lodging, hotels, financial? You know, I heard Tata's presentation, you know, a lot of my work is helping with financial. How do I deal with these costs? Um, I help with grants and insurance and Medicare Part D. Patients don't realize that, you know, a lot of patients don't have Medicare Part D because they didn't want to pay for drugs. Now they have to. Um, help them, um, just help, helping them, you know, have information, the best information that they can have to help them get through their, their diagnosis and treatment. And, you know, this symposium is a great way of educating patients. Um, so has a um, prostate education group, which, you know, be, before, um, but now they're virtual education group for anyone with prostate cancer for their caregiver. You don't have to be a patient at Roswell. Um, we have topics um, that range from genetics to um, integrative medicine, research trials, um, and anybody is welcome to email the, the email down here. Jessica Dorsum um, helps helps run this group and coordinate the speakers, and we're currently in the of um, setting up our speakers for 2021 and all those meetings now are virtual so all are welcome to attend and we look forward to having you. Okay. Caitlin, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, I, <laughs> I just want to just make sure uh, I'm hearing a lot of clicking in your audio. Is everything okay with that? When you talk, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything on. Okay. Yeah, I don't have uh, anything on. Okay. Well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for being part of this today. Um, I do have some questions for you. Um, what services do you have in place for non-English speakers? So um, non-English speakers, we have um, uh, written paperwork that comes in different languages. Um, we have a um, translator. Well, we used to have translators in the clinic, but we have a translator line. Um, so when patients come into clinic or if I want to communicate with a patient, it's actually like a three-way telephone. And there's a, and it comes with like, it's like 
about 250 different languages that somebody can help um, coordinate. You know, we all talk and patients can answer questions. It's translated, those, those kind of things. Okay. Uh, I've got some more here. Um, a, lot of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times things seem to go well when I'm at my office visit, but then between that and my next visit, I forget everything and feel alone. How do you help patients during this time, that gap time? Yeah, so the nice thing about my role is that, um, we, you know, because of the, the relationship that I, I form with patients, they often will call me or I encourage them to call me also when they leave clinic um, because they, they will leave clinic and they'll have a lot of questions or I'll, or I'll tell that something's going on um, and I'll call them afterwards um, to follow up, see, what's, see what I can do to help them. Um, but it can be very overwhelming. I think, you know, when we're in here to see the doctor, you know, doctors are seeing 20 to 30 patients in clinic and they don't have time to sit with patients for 30 or 45 minutes, but I do. So um, if I, I, because of my relationship with patients I and, and just getting to know them, sometimes I know when there's more going on that they don't want to share with the physician. Um, and that's the, the nice thing about my role. And, and then I can help set up whatever services they may need. What's the difference between an RN navigator and a hospital patient navigator? So here at Roswell, we use um, patient navigators who were patients, um, actual patients who underwent cancer treatment here at Roswell, which Richard I was also. one of them once upon a time, so, yes. Um, yeah, so they meet with patients, you know, as a, as a patient. Saying, hey, you know, I've been you. I know, I know what you're going through. Um, the reason that Roswell doesn't call our nurses navigators is because we have a patient navigation system, and we didn't want them to be confused. Okay. All of the nurse coordinators at Roswell, and they're in multiple clinics. We are all registered nurses, and so um, the patient navigators. Um, are just, just patients. They're really there to, to talk to the patients when they come into the hospital or to, um, you know, um, help them get from place to place or answer questions. You know, they've been through it so they can provide um, that, the, the support that patient to patient has. You know, I've been a nurse for over 20 years. My patient population is, is prostate. So I have hundreds of prostate patients. So I provide a different level of emotional support. Um, and I think that they're both equally important for patients. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, do all practices have RN navigators and do, all, and do they all communicate with one another? I.e., does my urologist contact you if I have to go see an oncologist? Yeah. So that's an interesting question. So not every practice has them. My guess is like small local urology offices wouldn't wouldn't have those. Um, nurse navigators, um, oncology coordinators are at large comprehensive cancer centers. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, you know, I frequently contact urology offices or primary care physicians, or um, I have patients who have local community coordinators, and I will call them and give them my contact information. Um, I reach out to primary care offices to say I, I coordinate for this patient. Um, I, I work with the, the VA a lot um, because those patients have to get their drugs and things um, through the VA. Um, so it, it, you, you'd have to ask um, your individual practice. The Buffalo I'm not sure they may because they're a large, um, l larger groups may, may have it. Okay. Um, you work with the uh, patients, of course, but uh, how important is, the, uh, is your role to the entire family? Uh, do you interact with all of them? Do you build that relationship? Yeah, I do. So um, most patients come with a family member and, um, you know, I sort of, I give the, you know, assuming that the, the patient is, gives permission, which usually they do if they're coming to visits with them. And, and everybody has my card. Um, I frequently get emails from, from patients, children, you know, who have companies or have a question or they'll call me. Um, sometimes it's challenging because, you know, I'll hear from several children who haven't communicated with each, each other. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm really here to help everybody. Um, I have referred, you know, I, I can think of one patient in particular, you know, he didn't need um, psychosocial support because he was dealing okay with his diagnosis or he told me he didn't want it, but his wife was really, really, really struggling. 
also, um, you know, she started meeting psychosocial team here at Roswell for support. And that really helped. Um, really, you know, patients can't be successful in their treatment and um, through their journey uh, unless, you know, they have the, the support from their family. And so I'm here to just kind of help everybody um, get on the same page, help significant others understand what it is that the patient wants you know there's those conflicting things sometimes the wife or the son wants wants the the patient to do something different and you know everybody kind of needs to be on the same page and I can help facilitate that as well got about 30 seconds left and I got a last one it's very important and it's a question I ask often myself um, who supports the nurses <laughs> so much for everybody else who takes care of you yeah, so um, I am very, very, very lucky in this urology clinic that we have a wonderful multidisciplinary team um, with, you know, physicians and our, our um, nurse practitioners and our PAs and, and my two colleagues. You know, I, I share a very small office with two colleagues and my boss and the nurses. I mean, we all sort of support each other and we definitely have those days where it's super frustrating. You know, a lot of my job, I can't get something scheduled because I'm waiting on somebody else to get something scheduled. And so, you know, I'm human, I vent, but, but we do a pretty good job of all supporting each other um, so that we can best help patients. Well, yeah, well, Caitlin, we are out of time. Uh, I wanted to uh, just thank you uh, for being part of this program today. I, thank you. Definitely, uh, you've added to uh, to all of it. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Um, so um, we've come to the end of our program today, uh, everyone. Uh, I want to thank those of us, uh, those of you who joined today. Thank you so very much, and I hope that you found the uh, uh, the program um, extremely valuable. Uh, the one thing we hope you'll do is talk with your family, uh, find out what your family medical history is, and then talk to your doctor. Educate yourself, uh, learn the facts about prostate cancer. We, we hope that today's program uh, helped with that. Um, as we always say, man up. Uh, and uh, what man up um, stands for is men I lie for the need to understand prostate cancer. So man up, we can save your life. I'm Richard Satterwhite. Uh, I wanna thank you for um, attending. I wish you all a great weekend. And before you leave, I want you to take a look. Uh, there's a tab on your screen uh, where you can visit our virtual display room so you can get another look at our sponsors. I'm sure they'd appreciate it. We'd appreciate it also if you just uh, take a look. Have a great weekend. See you around. Bye-bye.